Peace and blessings. Everyone, this is your brother Asar M. Hotep with the Madhu Andela Institute for the Advancement of Science and Culture. Um, I am here today on this Friday, February the 21st, uh, to discuss uh, my latest text, Aluja Volume 2, uh, China into Religion and Philosophy. And, you know, normally I'm up here doing a, uh, a lecture of some sort, but um, today I just wanted to kind of just give an overview, you know, of the book. And that was released in January of this year. And to answer any questions that uh, any, any of you may have concerning the book. And so uh, I know there's a number of people who are listening who have already uh, purchased and received the text and started reading. And there are those who intend to purchase the text uh, in the near future and, you know, may have some questions. And those who have already started reading may have some questions. And I don't expect everyone to have, who has purchased the text, to have read um, the text. Uh, you said there's feedback. Uh, peace, everyone who's in the chat. Um, someone said, is there feedback? Are y'all are hearing feedback? Is that what you're saying? Uh, to those who are in the chat, peace to Zane. Peace to Overstand, Daily TV, uh, Peace to Vayessa. Um, hold on a sec. Peace to Womp Womp. <laughs> Static in the mic, brother. Okay. Um, see, this was happening the last time. So I'm wondering if I need to get me a... Hold on one sec. Let me. I'm gonna unplug this mic, and y'all let me know if y'all can still hear me very well without the mic. So uh, here we go. Okay, I've unplugged the mic, and let me know if y'all still have the same issues as uh, before. I know there's going to be a time delay, so um, I'll wait a few seconds. Uh, let me know if y'all are still having problems uh, hearing me. Better? Okay. I appreciate I appreciate everyone. Um, please, for those who are just joining us, uh, hit the like button at the uh, in the center of your your screen uh, the more likes and I'm not one to do likes but you know when you when you like something it kind of pushes things in the ranks that it, it, it allows for people to see uh, the content and so um, as I was stating earlier that uh, Today's show is not so much of a lecture. Um, it's just a kind of a brief overview of the text. So I won't necessarily be showing any slides unless I have to um, or sharing my screen unless I have to. Uh, and it's a question and answer. So what I'm going to be doing over the next several months is sometime like during the last week or so of the month for like maybe the next four or, or five months, um, I will have a question and answer, a live question and answer session for those who, uh, who have purchased the book. And so the book is uh, close to 600 pages, roundabout. And, you know, it's a very thick text. It's an eight and a half by 11 text uh, in terms of the size. So I understand it's going to take people a minute to get through that text. 
given the size of the text and the nature of the content. So I don't expect a lot of questions. I just want to get the ball rolling and let everyone, you know, uh, who has any questions to, um, to ask them, you know, uh, you know, here, you know, saying at this moment. And so, you know, the, the chat is open and I guess I can get, you know, saying started. So as I have, um, I guess I'll share the screen for this just to show people the, the cover of the text. And out of the way. So <laughs> this is the book cover of the text. Um, the text again is Aluja China Into, uh, or I should say Aluja Volume 2, uh, China Into Religion and Philosophy. And um, peace to everyone who I missed earlier in terms of the chat. Uh, I think I said Kyla Siles, Donnie C, uh, Freddie the Third, uh, King Life, T Savior. Um, thank you all. Juan Love, uh, peace to all of y'all um, who are in the chat. Uh, peace to Sister Maika, if I'm uh, saying that correctly. Uh, peace to everyone. <laughs> so again, this is. Let me make this bigger. Let me go back do it like that there we go so that uh, people can see <laughs> let me see I'm just giving it a second on I have two screens up so I know it's gonna be a delay before you see things on the big screen cool beans all right so Aluja volume 2 is of course the second edition to uh, a series that i have called aluja and so aluja is a chiluba bantu word that means to uh retrace one's steps and to rebuild that which had been uh damaged it's kind of a a variant on the concept that we we know as sankofa so sankofa being a term found among the Akan people in West Africa, Ghana, and Aluja is a Chiluba Bantu word coming out of Central uh, Africa in the Democratic Republic of Congo. It is cognate with the root of the term in Egyptian, Suruj. So there's a word Ruj, which means this, essentially the same thing and also to flourish, um, to strengthen, etc. But Saruj is part of a phrase in ancient Kemet known as uh, Saruj Top, means the restoration of the world, to restore the world. And you would uh, hear kings talk about Saruj Ta, that they, that they have done Saruj Ta when they improved upon, you know, monuments or methods or concepts that the ancestors have laid the foundation. So with that said, the Aluja series is aimed to kind of restore the essential qualities, the essential essence of ancient Egyptian concepts and terms by using modern African languages and cultures that are related to ancient Egyptian to try and get some semblance of many of the concepts that you see in in ancient Kemet. So we're we're using ancient Kemet to help explain certain things in modern African cultures and we're using modern African cultures to kind of you know help to explain some obscure things in ancient Kemet. So it's a variety of topics, it's not a singular topic text. Um and I chose to kind of focus on religious concepts and fundamentally f philosophic concepts like the nature of God, the nature of health, the nature of, you know, um, ma'at, what is that really, you know, from a linguistic perspective. And 
and so on and so on. And so um, I may show the table of contents and things of that nature um, <laughs> for those uh, so we can see what is actually in uh, the, the text. So this, this particular text is on sale right now, and you can get it from my website at www.asarmhotep.com. So um, remember, for, for those who are just joining us, this is a question and answer uh, session. So for those of you who uh, have purchased the book already and started reading, and you have some questions, if I wasn't clear or something in the text, this is one of those opportunities that you can ask me live and we can um, iron things out, you know, uh, you know, publicly for those who may have the same question. So, you know, we treat this like a classroom, uh, so to speak. So I can hold on one sec. Let me do it like this. Let me. Let me do that. Peace to King Life. And um, I activated last week the super chat. So for those um, who are feeling generous and want to keep this, uh, this channel going and growing or whatnot and want to donate, um, you know, please do. Uh, I use the the funds to purchase text and I usually give away the text um, you know to to people who are interested and but I, I use that information and I create uh, lectures you know that I provide uh, for free for everyone on the internet so um, your donations uh, would be very welcome and uh, thank you so uh, I mentioned that term Aluja and so when you you first open the text that's one of the things that you see is is how it's defined it means to make provide to retrace one step to refer to a place of origin uh, to restore and so that is the aim of the text and so uh, I'm just going to the table of contents and I wanted to dedicate this text to uh, the late Dr. John S. Mbiti and so I think he passed in December of 2019. And he is famous for his um, introduction into African religion and philosophy text. And so for those of us who have ever taken Africana studies classes in college, I'm pretty sure that you had to read this text by uh, the late John S. Mbiti. So it's only fitting that in his passing, him becoming an ancestor, that I dedicate this text um, dealing with African religion and philosophy um, to him. And so that, that was one of my foundational texts in learning about African religion and philosophy in African cultures. So um, we pour out libations for Dr. Mbiti. So <laughs> these are the chapters of the text and so the the text is broken up into two parts and um so we have part one and part two so part one has to deal with just you know a number of uh random topics per se that uh, may or may not be related to each other but just individual topics that you know i address as individual chapters chapters one through seven but the second half of the text is my response to dr wesley muhammad uh who wrote a text ra is allah why asar imhotep is wrong so i have dedicated what is this one two three four five six chapters to addressing his book and the claims that were made in his book so uh, I'll just go through each chapter right now. So <laughs> chapter one is the linguistic analysis of the word ma'at. Uh, chapter two, and, and you know, that's pretty self-explanatory. 
Uh, the word ma'at is being, you know, used a lot in Egyptology. But in my search for trying to find a good understanding of the concept of ma'at, I noticed that there was no serious linguistic analysis of the word ma'at, especially with African languages. And the, the, the ones that I found, I found very lacking. You know, they only did an analysis in passing and nothing was really dedicated, you know, saying to the tech, I mean, to the concept of Ma'at. So, uh, Ma'at is, uh, in linguistic chapter one is dedicated, you know, a serious dedication to the, the study of the term Ma'at. And so in chapter two, we have the etymology of the word Seneb. So, for those of us who are familiar with ancient Egyptian uh, greetings to the kings, you know that Seneb, the word for health, is part of a tutelage that goes by Unk Uja Seneb, you know, uh, life, prosperity, and health to the king. And so I was doing some other linguistic work and I just happened to stumble on a, a proper linguistic analysis for the word Seneb. So I decided to write an entire chapter uh, dedicated to that topic in terms of what health is and how we can analyze that word uh, Seneb. And you'll be very surprised to find that the word Seneb is actually a dialectical variation of the word Unk. And so you'll, you'll find those details in the text. Uh, peace to Brother Jehuti, uh, Ma'at in the chat, and Black Lion Supreme. I don't know if I've said your name already, but uh, peace to y'all in the chat. <laughs> and so the next one is Medunetcher, a catalyst for an African scientific renaissance. And so this article or this chapter here is my take on possibly using the Medunetcher, uh, teaching Medunetcher, as a catalyst for teaching uh, biomimicry, which is a scientific approach to understanding nature and how nature solves problems in trying to mimic those problem solving techniques of nature in our synthetic solutions to modern problems, uh, whether they be in terms of a service or particular products where you know we can build sustainable things. So this has to deal with with science in that. So, um, speaking of science, of course, chapter four is the African origin of the word science. And I had to write this article or this chapter because there was a lot of us talking about, you know, uh, science and how we can utilize science to our advantage and how this is part of our African heritage. And then you would hear a lot of us in the community trying to rally against those of us who promote science and they the reason why they say that is because they believe that science itself is a european and a white man's invention in things and so this chapter addresses that saying that not only is science itself the activity a an african endeavor so is the very word science itself and that you can even find it in ancient Kemet. So that's what that chapter is dedicated to. Um, chapter five is Pataho Tep and the Dual Hunger. This is more on the philosophy side. I explained this concept of the dual hunger. Um, I got this from Dr. Kaikosa Kajangu, who you know I kind of cite a lot in this text. Um, he is a wisdom seeker and professor who now lives and teaches in Maryland but is originally from, I think, Malawi in, um, in East Africa. And he has written a lot extensively on uh, African initiatory systems and wisdom traditions uh, throughout Africa. And he is a part of a number of these wisdom traditions. And so I hope to have him on my program uh, sometime in the near future. So me and him have been talking. Uh, matter of fact, me and him have been in touch over the years. Um, but um, but in terms of recently to being on the show. So 
uh, you know, that is a, a is a good topic in terms of this notion of dual hunger. <clears throat> Hold on. Towards an et uh, the next chapter is chapter six. Towards an etymology of the word siba. Uh, we know the word siba is a word for uh, teacher. And um, it, it is a surprising etymology for that that you will find. And then, of course, chapter seven on the meaning of Kemet. So a lot of y'all may know that I've been engaged in uh, a several year long debate with folks on the meaning and etymology of the word Kemet. So I give a full treaty uh, starting on page 255 of this text, which is chapter seven. And. Uh, so it, that's actually, I should say, part two to the conversation. So part one, for those of you who, you know, have been following the debates, um, I, I, would, I would argue that part one is in our text, a contribution to the debate on the meaning of the place named Kemet. Uh, this was written by the Shimsu Heru research team. And... This text um, was written by uh, myself, uh, Brother Wujaru, Iri Ma'at, and Brother Sanjeti, all of the Amara squad. And, you know, we, we, we laid out some preliminary arguments uh, concerning the place named Kemet. And so we're going to actually have a larger book that is dedicated to the, to the topic but my essential argument is is here you find in chapter seven. So um, hold on one second. Uh, I think someone's asking a question. Um, would you recommend someone read an introductory book on linguistics along with your book, especially if they have no experience in the field of study? <laughs> um, the question is yes and no. Um, the having an, an introductory knowledge of linguistics will will definitely help you to to better understand the text but uh it was my intent to write the text in a way that you could still follow and start picking up on some of the rules and concepts um, without necessarily having a background in linguistics. And so I'm not dealing with any kind of reconstructions, you know, um, dealing with anything like, you know, categorizing languages and stuff to that nature. We're only using linguistics as a tool, comparative linguistics as a tool to better understand the, the concepts in ancient Kemet. So the, 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 the underlying uh, philosophy is that languages do not exist in a vacuum, that cultures do not exist in a vacuum, that just like human beings, um, human beings have relatives, brothers, sisters, cousins, aunts, uncles, etc. And if you want to get some insight into the person, say a Sarim Hotep, you have to interview, you have to interrogate my mother, my brothers, my, my uncles, my grandfather, my great grandfather and mother, etc., to get a sense of the history that and the experiences that led to you know what you have observed as the brother of Sarim Hotep. And that they will be able to answer questions that I may not have alluded to in any of my conversations or your experiences with me. And so with that being said, it's the same thing with, lingu with linguistics uh, or languages, um, to use that as an analogy. You know, the ancient Egyptian language has brothers and sisters. It has, you know, aunts and uncles and cousins, etc. And these words that you find in the ancient Egyptian language, the brothers and sisters also have those words and those concepts. And oftentimes those rituals and those things to that nature. And so 
if something, if the ancient Egyptians, for example, doesn't define the word ma'at in any of its text, how do we understand what the word means? Well, we can go to the brothers and sisters and cousins of the ancient Egyptian language like Yoruba, like Wolof, like Basa, like Mbochi, Chiluba, Zande, etc. And we can get a sense of what that term means because they have inherited the same term. So now when we collectively, you know, interrogate all of those other languages, now we can go back into ancient Egypt and, and plug in the values that we've retrieved from the other languages. And then they're able to tell us alongside with the primary documentation found in ancient Egypt, the, the fundamental meanings and expanded meanings and nuances of this term. So that's how I use linguistics to answer these particular types of questions. So with that said, it's, it's not necessary for you to do it, but it definitely will help. So if you're trying, it, so you'll know exactly what I mean when I'm talking about phonemes, you know, um, and philology, and I'm using these, these terms. And so I try to define terms that I don't think are, are normally talked about in just everyday language. So I try my best to define terms throughout the text. So um, I hope that that helps and answers your question uh, for those who are listening. So uh, peace to everyone who is uh, just now joined. And so as I have told earlier, uh, as I stated earlier in our conversation that this is just a brief overview of the text, um, Aluja Volume 2, Chin Into Religion and Philosophy, and that this is a question and answer uh, session. And so I don't have a slideshow per se uh, for the, today's conversation. I'm just, you know, giving my insights on the text. And any of y'all who have uh, questions, you know, uh, y'all can ask them, you know, seeing here. And I'll try my best to answer them for you. And so along that same line, uh, I teach an introductory course on linguistics. And I offered this class online through my website precisely so that you can follow my arguments. And so if you, you know, I think it's like $25 or $50 for the class and you have access to the material for a year on my website. And so I give you a number of resources in, in text and things so that you can you can study at your own pace and follow along and, and things of that nature. So for those who are interested in an introductory course in linguistics, um, again, it's only $25 or $50 is one of those two because I have two classes and the price is, is one of those prices. So um, visit my website, asarmhotep.com. And, you know, all of that information will will be available to you. And again, I provide you with resources. So you get the, the phonology charts, you know, uh, some some lessons online in terms of video. I give you some some textbooks. Uh, there's only one text that you have to buy, but I give you some supplementary text um, and things of that nature. So uh, it's a very thorough class. So uh, check that out. Let me see if there's anything else. Um, yeah. <laughs> now, it's not Robert Rand on the cover uh, of the book. So someone asked, is that Robert Rand on the cover? No, um, it is actually a, a, a picture from the, the Nubian era. Of, of ancient Kemet, the 25th dynasty, um, that was taken in the Nubian Museum in Aswan. And so that's that's my photo from the Nubian Museum in Aswan. And um, so, but no, every time you upload that, that book cover,
for anybody who's friends with Robert Rand on Facebook, it's going to automatically tag them. And um, because it, you know, his face looks just like the, the, the face of that Nubian statue. So, but yeah, so let me continue. So the second half of the book, as I stated earlier, is the response to Wesley Muhammad. So, excuse me. As I stated earlier, he wrote a book called Ra as Allah, Why Asar Imhotep is Wrong. He wrote a whole book dedicated to me. So I have read the book. I have assessed the book. And instead of writing an entire book dedicated to him, I just decided to open up some space in this volume and uh, discuss the merits of his book uh, in the second half. So it has its own introduction to kind of give you a background and history of the the essential argument and so that is chapter eight and from there on starting in chapter nine i go with the theoretical assumptions and i discuss the comparative method so for june money not june money who was it that asked that question earlier uh, let me go up just a little bit um to Freddie the Third, um, if you have the book, um, there's some concepts and things that I explain starting with chapter nine. So, if you have the book, I would recommend, you know, that you skip if if you're having some trouble, skip all the way to chapter nine. And read chapter nine first and then go back and read the introduction and the the first chapter, etc. Because chapter nine sets again the precedence of the essential nature of how to use linguistics and what to look out for. And so it, it is this theoretical framework for which, you know, the whole entire book is is written. But I um I, I kept it, I put it towards on the second half of the book because I wanted to keep it fresh in the minds of the readers while they are examining my arguments against Dr. Wesley Muhammad's uh, Ra is a law text. So, um, and this is where you will find a lot of the citations which challenge the notion of the validity of the Afro-Asiatic or Niger Congo, or um, Nilo Saharan language families from um, Joseph Greenberg. And so y'all know that a lot of folks want to challenge me on, on the validity of these language families, but they don't have the background and understanding of linguistics to make these arguments when they try to challenge people like Jean-Claude Emboli, myself, or Dr. Theofalo Benga, who, who challenges the validity of the Joseph Greenberg categories. And so that is an, a very important chapter for understanding why we reject Afro-Asiatic, et cetera, Nilo Saharan, Niger Congo, et cetera. So all of that is explained and citations, numerous citations are provided and you get a better understanding of what the arguments is and why nobody can argue against us concerning Afro-Asiatic or Niger Congo, et cetera, et cetera. So from there is, of course, chapter 10. So now I'm doing the work. I'm starting to do the work. So one of the things that I argued against Dr. Wesley Muhammad in my text is that he wrote an entire book um, trying to argue with me on whether the, the name of Ra in ancient Egypt is equivalent to the word Allah amongst the Arab speakers. 
and the the, the proto-Semitic speakers when they pronounce it as El or Ella. Um, so before I can make any arguments, I need to set up the sound correspondences between the African languages and the Semitic languages. So we can get to the bottom of, well, what is the etymology of Ra and what is the etymology of Allah and do they match? So that's what you're seeing starting in chapter 10. And then in chapter 11, I actually give the etymology of Allah. Then chapter 12 deviates a little bit because now I'm talking about the nature of God in spirit in African religions. And it's all tied into this conversation about Allah, et cetera, et cetera. And then in chapter 13, I, I, I sum it all up with my theory on the conditions for borrowing in Semitic. So the, the, what I argue is that the word that became Allah in the Arabic language was actually borrowed from the ancient Egyptian language. And so when you understand that, then you can understand chapter 13. Well, what are the, the conditions? How did the Semitic languages end up borrowing these terms, you know, from, from ancient Egypt? And, and so that's what, how that is explained. And so um, I skipped over the, inch, the actual introduction but the introduction is almost 100 pages <laughs> in of itself. So basically, the way that I can sum up the introduction is the West Af the West and Central African uh, connections to ancient Egypt. So, you know, if y'all heard of my, my last uh, conversation, uh, then you... Uh, in terms of the, the connections between West Africa and ancient uh, Kemet, then you will get an extensive, you know, list in, uh, of things in the ways that West and Central Africa connect with ancient Kemet. From, from linguistic, from conceptual, from ritual, fr from migrations and trade, all of that is discussed in the very introduction of the text. And so, uh, peace to everything is everything. Uh, thank you for your donation. Um, I hope it stays up. I'm, how can you pin it? I think there's a way that you can pin it. Um, so, yes, thanks to everything is everything, you know, for, for the donation. <laughs> and so, um, so, basically, this is what is contained in the book. So there's 13 chapters, and as I said, it's almost, uh, you know, 600 pages, about 50 pages shy of 600. And so it's a very thick book. Um, and so let me see, I think someone had a question. So Maribontus, uh, please forgive me if I uh, pronounced that incorrectly. Um, this person asked, did all language come out of one in Africa? Uh, it's yes and no. That's, that's my, that's my answer. It's a, it's a yes and no. We know that all homo sapiens sapiens derive out of Africa and with the Homo sapiens sapiens uh, deriving out of Africa, they, they, the ones who left Africa, of course, left speaking a language. Technically, from, in, 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 from a biological standpoint at least, all human languages are related because they all come out of that single group of Africans who left Africa um, speaking a mother, you know, a quote unquote world mother tongue. And, uh, they left with their languages, uh, and then spread across the world. Well, languages change over time and the relationships between languages 
become blurred the further, the more distant in time that we get. So this is something that I, uh, I explore in the text. Let me see if I can go there. So this is something that I discussed in chapter 13 that um, the, what should I say, uh, let me, let me find it. So here we go. So I deal with that question in terms of, well, how do you uh, talk about relationships in, in African languages? And so I, I put forth this model that was uh, put forth by a, a researcher by the name of Pisani, who I cite here, uh, who wrote a text um, in 1952. And yeah, this is the quote right here. So... <laughs> There is in linguistics, there is a what we call a tree model. So if you can imagine a tree, you know, there's a, a trunk, a singular trunk that grows into different branches. They all belong to the same tree. However, the branches, the individual branches are separated at different intervals, the higher up of the tree you go. So African language families are seen in many respects like a tree. So you'll, you'll read in the text about a language family tree. Now, we should really kind of understand this as a kind of a metaphor and not necessarily reality of how languages are formed. Because um, it's, it's not that cut and dry that you can have a family tree in that instance. And in that, you know, uh, just like in your family tree, how, for example, you know, you have a great grandmother and grandfather who gave birth to, you know, your grandfather or grandmother, and then they marry somebody else. And um, so now you have an expanded tree in terms of your genetic makeup and your DNA and things. So, now your your great grandfather or mother marries some other great grandmother or father, and they give birth to you know one of um, your grandfathers or grandmothers, et cetera, et cetera, on down the line. We can go and trace the genealogy of the person through their you know genealogical tree, and so it's very easy to do that on a human scale, given that we have the records. But in languages, that's not the case. And so um, so there have been several problems been trying to identify language families by the tree model. And this is kind of an expanded, a, you know, kind of an upper level argument or a series of arguments. Um, but I'll just introduce this concept here. And this is what I talk about in the book. And so Pisani trying to give us a new model on how language families and stuff are formed. He says, in reality, the term linguistic relationship and the images it invokes lead to an erroneous vision, as does the other related term genealogical tree. An image which corresponds much better to linguistic reality could be suggested by a complex water system. A river which gathers the water of streams and creeks unites at a center point with another river, then bifurcates again. Then each branch unites again with other water courses, perhaps even with one of several descendants of the other branch. Lakes are formed from which new rivers emerge and so on. So what he's trying to do here is suggest that languages and language families don't actually emerge from a tree model but more so like a river model so you know rivers 
you know, branch off and join lakes and lakes give birth to new rivers and things to that nature. <laughs> so uh, on the next page, that was on page 531 of the text, I give, you know, the uh, kind of a graph of the river model. So imagine, for example, that these are rivers. So this is River A, this is River B, and this is River C. And then these three rivers join here at point E, and now they all flow into one river and become F, right? So you see over here that River B and River C join and become D. And so we're using this analogously to how languages are formed. So language A and language B and language C may come together at different points in time in history and merge through a process called convergence and become one new language altogether. And then they start and branch off like a tree and become a different language family. And it can happen in reverse. So just how like this happens and becomes one singular language or language family, we see, you know, in, in a different type of, of the model where you have a singular family that branches off, you see here in two branches. And then you see over here that H um, becomes a node in itself, it branches into two branches. And then they come together later on and become a different language altogether. And so this becomes very important when you're talking about trying to go to higher levels of understanding of relationships between languages. So this is what we argue happened with Negro Egyptian, which I call Chiana Intu, and for example, Proto-Indo-European and Semitic languages. So we say that Semitic languages derive from a series of interactions between different languages that belong to different language families. And this is how you get Proto-Semitic. And the same thing with um, Proto-Indo-European. So let me skip all the way to the beginning of the book and where I'm talking about Negro Egyptian, AKA Chiena Intu uh, language family. And so many of you may have seen, especially if you have my book, Nesubiti, King and Ancient Egyptian, um, that came out in 2016. Well, I updated this with uh, Brother Jean-Claude and Boli's uh, blessings because he's coming out with a new text and he has altered his uh, Negro Egyptian model that we see, you know, here. So, um, hopefully, uh, do, 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 do. okay. So we have the, the so-called Negro Egyptian language family that has broken off into three branches and then interacted. So I have renamed the whole the whole language family Chi and Kanda. And then Chi and the Intu is a type, is a different language family that results out of the interactions uh, here. So we have Chi and Kanda Chikulu, which is Chi and Kanda archaic. This is the beginnings of the language family. It branches off into three different branches that we call Kikwe, Kweki, and Kikuki. These branches interact with each other. So that's what these arrows are indicating. So you see these arrows, they enter, if you see them crossed like this, that means that they were interacting with each other. And so when, you, when languages are in contact, they share vocabulary, they share morphology and grammar features and stuff to this nature. Well, the Kikwe and Kweki group were interacting and living with each other so long that their languages converged into a singular type. And that singular type, I argue, is a new language family. 
which I call Chiena Intu. So Chiena Intu is this um, family that, that was born due to convergence. And it has some slight interactions with the Kikuki group, but is mainly made up of Kikwe and Kweki. And it's, so it is from this branch of the Chien Kanda language family that Chien Intu emerges for which two different dialects emerge, the Bere and the Beher. And out of the Bere branch comes the Hausa language, the Zande language, and Middle Egyptian. Out of the Beher dialect comes Coptic, Songo, and Somali. Proto-Bantu comes from this Bere dialect of Chiena Intu. And it is Proto-Bantu that, that um, has interactions with, I should go back here, this Kikuki group. Um, Jean-Claude and Boli has now at this stage of the, the language family development becomes this branch called Kabad. And so these these Beher and Ber and the word Kabad is words for liver in these respective uh, languages. And there's a linguistic, morphological, phonological history that is explained regarding how these words are formed and they become representative of how words are formed in these respective branches. So this branch Kaban, after interacting with the Behev dialect of, of Chin Intu, becomes pre-proto-Semitic. And then pre-proto-Semitic interacts with Proto-Bantu and this is how we get proto-Semitic. So, um, hold on, someone's saying it's static. Uh, hold on one sec. I'm, I wonder if this is the reason. Hold on. stuff going on in the um, in the house so there's a heater on and I'm wondering if that is interfering with the with the sound so I don't know what what is going on with the sound um, y'all let me know if uh, it sounds better I sound good now better testing testing okay all right so i think i think it's when the heater comes on that um it's causing the static so um if it comes on again i just turned it off um if it starts static staticking again then of course my hypothesis has been falsified um so uh <laughs> no, I'm not messing with it. Um, <clears throat> so, um, okay. So, uh, I don't know how much of, you know, what y'all heard uh, beforehand. So, um, I hope I don't have to necessarily start again. But, I'll just say, it said it went out when I said in Bowley. Okay. Uh, well, ooh. <laughs> okay. So, Continuing from from what I was saying, you know, earlier that, you know, we're, we're trying to explain possibly how language families are formed. And so I'm get, I gave an example of the river delta model and I'm showing how that the river delta model is a, a good model to 
to understand how language families are formed and branch off. And I'm saying that this is exactly how Jean-Claude Mboli uh, imagines the, uh, the formation and expansion of Negro Egyptian. And so, uh, as I stated earlier, I renamed Negro Egyptian and I gave my reasons for the renaming um, of Negro Egyptian. And I named it Chi and Kanda. And Chi and Kanda is a, the Chi Luba Bantu word for uh, Kemet. It's a cognate for the word Kemet. And you'll find out how in chapter seven when I deal with the etymology of the word Kemet. But um, Chi and Intu specifically speaks about this language grouping right here. And so as I, as I mentioned, Chi and Kanda Chikulu, archaic. Uh, in the second branch, the classic stage, it branches into three different uh, dialects or, or languages. And so they become what we call Kikwe, Kweki, and notice how the words are formed here. So this tells you about the syllabification of the groups and Kikuki. So Kikwe and Kweki have been living amongst each other for a very long time and their languages begin to converge on one another to become a common type. And so now we argue that it becomes a different family altogether. It becomes its own family. So that family we call Chiena Intu. Uh, if you read Jean-Claude Mboli's work, he's still gonna call it Negro Egyptian. So Chiena Intu is my conceptualization uh, for this, but this actual branching and all this, this is still Jean-Claude Mboli's work. So as I said, um, I got Jean-Claude Mboli's blessings for the renaming. Everything is the same with the exception of the renaming of the, the major branches of this um, language family. So the Kikuki group becomes the Kabed branch and the Kabed branch interacting with the Bihar dialects become pre-proto-Semitic. The Proto-Bantu interacting with Proto-Semitic, uh, excuse me, with pre-Proto-Semitic now becomes Proto-Semitic. So, um, you said it's back again. Uh, okay, so I don't know, again, I don't know what is going on um, as far as the static is concerned. So, I'll have to look into this somehow. Um, later, but, um, you know, so, uh, to deal with that question, um, that's, that's, you know, this just is kind of a synopsis. So of course, when I deal with this in, in the book, you have a lot more information to go over. That is a lesson into itself. And so, uh, let me kind of scroll back up before the static to see if there was any questions that I missed. Um, um, someone asked, um, can I spell the brother's name who I said I cited frequently in chapter five? His name is Dr. Kaikosa Kajangu. So Kaikosa Kajangu. Um, and so I'm putting it in the chat right now. So <clears throat> it's it's at the bottom. I know it's going to be a delay, but it's at the bottom of the, the chat right now. Dr. Kaikosa Kajangu. And so let me scroll up. I think there was something else. Um, where are the ancient people of Kemet today? Or are they extinct? No, um, some people of of the descendants of the people who lived during the time of Pharaonic of the Pharaonic kingdom, uh, a lot of them still live in Egypt today, but they're marginalized and everybody calls them Nubians. Or they are, there's a lot of admixture in, in ancient Kemet with the, the original descendants uh their children 
intermarrying with foreigners. And now you have their DNA intermingled with foreign DNA. And so, um, and then you have some who just migrated out of Africa and went into Central Africa and some going into West Africa. And so uh, the their, their DNA is not extinct. However, the, the pharaonic culture as we understand it, as we saw in the pyramid texts, in the, the rhyme mathematical papyri, the, um, the temple walls, et cetera, et cetera. That culture is dead um, because, you know, the, the living descendants don't have that memory outside of Egyptology books um, to a large extent and, you know, no one's building temples and writing in hieroglyphs and, and speaking the ancient language, et cetera, et cetera. So that, that is not, um, so I, I hope I answered your question in that way. And so, uh, in Usere asks, and this was referring to the language question about the singular language question. Uh, you mean the language leaving Africa some 200,000 years ago and the one from 45,000 to 5,000 years ago? Um, I'm talking about the Homo sapiens sapiens who left Africa from that, you know, I think it's between 75 and, and 30,000 years ago. And so those Africans are were, were speaking languages and language, human language originates in Africa. And so um, those languages are ultimately in the very, very long distance past related to African languages. However, though they're not, de the relationship is not detectable in any very, you know, good sense. So, you know, now when we talk about relationships, we're talking about relationships that we can detect and prove using a historical comparative method. So, um, so an acts, uh, Imhotep Ross, I'm curious about the language of the Jarawa people. Do they speak an African language? Um, the Jarawa, uh, if I'm not mistaken, are these the people that are like in India, uh, on the island or whatnot, kind of close to Australia? If so, no, they would not speak in quote unquote African language, unless you're talking about an African language in the greater sense of human language. And so all languages ultimately are African languages because language itself originates in Africa, um, but only in that sense. But when we talk about African languages, we're talking about the languages that are, you know, detectable in terms of how the historical comparative method. So, um, hold on, um, Vyasa Nicolo Gula asks, Asar, have you ever looked at and compare the people of Colombia who speak what they call uh, as soon as it's Pelenquero with the Kikongo speaking family to see how languages can transfer and merge with others. Um, no, I have not looked at that particular instance. And so I know there there have been others who have, you know, researched and shown how certain African words and concepts have been brought over here into the new world, especially in South America, where a lot of it was able to be maintained more. Uh, unlike here in the United States, we weren't able to keep a lot of the words in, in things. We kept some of the grammar and what we call African American vernacular uh, English in terms of the grammar and the pronunciation and phonology. But in terms of the, the language in the strictest sense, we weren't able to keep it like a lot of folks were able to uh, keep certain uh, large chunks and aspects of the African languages in South America. But that that work has been done. But I personally haven't looked at Kikongo and Palenquero, uh, et cetera. So now I'm going to skip back down. Um, okay. Thanks for the answer and the teachings. You're welcome. Um, Brother Ifa Tunde asks, can you explain for the audience what is the difference between determined and determinant in the pre-classical stage of Chiankanda Chikulu? 
Uh, who that is a. I'll do that in a separate link. I'll do that in a separate um, video. And I think I think one is warranted for explaining uh, China into and of itself. And so because there's there's some other concepts that I, 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 it'll be best to make some slides for that. Um, and so I, I mention it in the text, but I don't go into detail. That's just one of those kind of things that you kind of have to kind of know and kind of research on your own what it means in terms of a determined and a determinant because these have to deal with um, uh, classes and and you know we have to deal with the accent marks and stuff to that nature so that takes some explaining so I'll I'll make a separate video strictly for that okay um, hold on uh, Imhotep Ross asks, is there a link to the ancient Kemet uh, people in their recently discovered Jarawa African people of India? Um, I don't think so. I don't, I don't know what information um, you're gathering about this Jarawa people and um, any links to ancient Kemet. So you'll have to provide a link to a study. Hopefully it's a credible study. Um, where they where they make these connections, but I'm f unfamiliar at this present time to any connections between the Jarawa uh, people of India and ancient Kemet. So, um, if Atunde again, please explain for the audience how does this updated model support or discredit Dr. Wesley Muhammad's claim of the relationship between Kemetic people and the Arabic speakers in Arabia. Um, I don't think the updated model in of itself has to deal with um, necessarily discrediting, um, per se, the the arguments from Dr. Wesley Muhammad. Uh, but as I as I state um, prior to matter of fact, let me just go ahead and and show you you know this this is in chapter eight in the introduction so i don't know what page that's chapter seven let me skip down to chapter eight here we're dealing with kimmet boom 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 um Um, so I mentioned in the, the text, Luke volume two in chapter, um, eight that, you know, we got to remember that Wesley Muhammad's argument is that the word L, a proto-Semitic L, uh, which became an Arabic language, Allah, and the word Ra in ancient Kemet, they are both cognate terms. And so when we talk about a cognate, let me, let me, let me go to the page where this is properly defined. So this is in chapter nine, theoretical assumptions in the comparative method. So, um, so this is how we define a cognate. So, th and this is taken from Lyle Campbell and Mauricio J. Mixco in a glossary of historical linguistics, 2007. And so they define a cognate as such, a word or morpheme that is related to a word morpheme in sister languages by reason of these words morphemes having been inherited by the related languages from a common word morpheme of the proto language from which they descend and so they give some answers here so let me kind of re recap on this a cognate is a word or a morpheme that is related to another morpheme word or morpheme in a sister language by reason of the these words um, or morphemes having been inherited 
by the related languages from a common word or morpheme of the proto language from which they descend. So in order for words to be cognates, we have to demonstrate that they both descend from the same common ancestor. And so we do this by establishing cognate sets. So a cognate set is a set of cognate words or morphemes, um, a set of words related to one another in the sister languages because they are inherited and descend from a singular word morpheme of the proto language. And I state that this becomes important because of the claim that Dr. Wesley uh, Muhammad makes. And so I talk about um, a correspondence that I have with Dr. Christopher Ellett, Christopher, <laughs> Christopher Ellett, Christopher uh, Errett. And so Christopher Errett wrote a book in 1995 called Reconstructing proto Afroasiatic proto afrasian Vowels, Tone, Consonants, and Vocabulary. Um, <laughs> I asked Dr. West, uh, excuse me, Dr. Uh, Errett about the origins of proto-Semitic L that you see right here. And this was his response because I, I asked him because I noticed that in uh, the proto the this reconstructing proto afriasiatic text that he did not provide an etymology for the word the proto Semitic L, and he didn't provide any cognates for it. One could argue because you know the word God is not necessarily considered a a basic vocabulary word, but basic vocabulary words give rise to theological concepts. So that's what I cite right here from Ludwig Kohler. I noted that the theological and also the more far-reaching religious world of ideas grew out of the non-theological, the common, and whatever one wished to say theologically was expressed in language drawn from the common world of ideas. In other words, all of these so-called deep religious ideas or words and concepts that we, that we uh, say are proper nouns, so to speak, they are, in fact, um, come from just everyday, ordinary, common words in the language. So I asked Dr. Errett, um, from, from what is the everyday common word for which the proto-Semitic L derives, where we get ultimately the word Allah from in Arabic. And so <laughs> he replies here, he says, thank you very much for your note. I am very sorry to have taken so long to reply. I put your message aside until after the holidays because I needed more time to give your question a full answer. I wanted to look deeper into the additional reconstructions because since his 1995 book, he has done more work and he's supposed to be releasing sometime soon an updated version of his Afroasiatic reconstructions. And so he, he said, because um, he's doing another 2,000 plus uh, reconstructions, he says that I have discovered for Proto-Afroasiatic, Proto-Afrasian Proto as he calls it, since my 1995 book. And I, also, and I also rechecked a bunch of dictionaries. So when I asked him this question, this was like in like November of you know, the year, I forgot what year this was. I think this was like in 2013. So I, I, I asked him like in November of 2013, he didn't get back to me until January of 2014. So in that time, he was researching my question. And so he replied back to me, besides that first part of the correspondence, he says, what still appears to be the case is that proto-Semitic, the proto-Semitic root, al, is limited to Semitic. It is not found in, in the other branches, and it cannot be traced back to the parent proto afroasiatic language. I have some possible leads to follow up on the origin of the term, and I will be working on publishing more on the family in another three to four years. 
I have a lot of in-between work to do first on the Cushitic branch especially. The, the ancient Afro-Asian word for God and probably specifically the God of one's own community, as you have probably already encountered in your reading for the classes you mentioned, was Netu. Or, um, this is the root word from which the ancient Egyptian word for God, Netur, um, comes from, as does the proto-Southern Cushitic term Netur spirit. It goes at least back to the proto Erythraic language spoken probably around 17,000 years ago, but it does not occur in the Omotic branch of the family. So this is Christopher Arid, um, personal communication dated 125-2014. So to answer Brother Ifatunde's question, if the... Um, now I got to go back up to the beginning to where that chart was. Um, and let me reduce this window. Uh, uh, here we go. So if <laughs> we were to take Christopher, Dr. Christopher Eric's word on it, what he's saying is that the word Allah in L does not go beyond proto-Semitic. So it is not an Afro-Asiatic term. It is only relegated to Semitic. Well, if that is the case, if we're going by the standard Joseph Greenberg Afro-Asiatic um, uh, conceptualization of the language phylum, which includes Egyptian, Omotic, Cushitic, Chadic, Berber and Semitic. And so it does not go back to Proto Afroasiatic. This means that Ra and Allah cannot be cognates according to that model because the word Al, the Proto Semitic Al, is an invention of the Semitic language. So, um, so by, by that, that already knocks. Wesley Muhammad's argument out the box. But of course, we don't do, you know, the, what do we call it? The uh, appeal to authority. So if I just wanted to appeal to authority on Wesley Muhammad, I could just post that and leave it as such. But that's not how we do things here. We actually do the work. And so when I did the work, I come to find out that it is not an invention of the Semites, that they borrowed the term from the ancient Egyptian language. And so that is what is discussed in the text. So his model doesn't necessarily speak to that question, um, but more so the, it, it, it helps to um, talk about the, the interactions between the African languages and the proto-Semitic or the uh, pre-proto-Semitic, um, their interactions and how that forms proto-Semitic. So uh, thank you to Kerry T or Kerry L T. Um, thank you for the donation. And let me see if there's any uh, other questions. It says you would like you would like the people I mentioned because they stayed isolated and held the language. I'll see about getting some information to you. I appreciate it, Brother Gula. Um, Eva Tunde again, how would you, we prepare for those who support the Africanity of Islam to use this linguistic chart to support a Ma'atic Islam? Um, I don't know if this could be used to, uh, to support a Ma'atic Islam in the sense that you would have to see if the words Islam and the words Ma'at even, not necessarily that they would be cognates, because I don't think that they're cognates in any way, but that they are the same concept. And so as I discuss in my chapter on Ma'at, the word Ma'at has to deal with open-hearted sharing. It means to share food. But the word Islam has to do with submission, like submission to an authority and a quote unquote submission to God. It's two different concepts. 
you know, one is essentially slavery and one has to deal with open hearted sharing with your fellow man in the community. So it's, it's, it's two totally different concepts. So the, the chart isn't going to help uh, make that argument in terms of, um, of Ma'atic Islam. So let me see. Did the letter L exist in ancient Egyptian? I don't think so. Um, if it did, it wasn't a phoneme. It was an allophone of the 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 sound R or the, the nasalized uvular trill R. I know that the regular R, which is symbolized by the mouth hieroglyph, is um, sometimes in comparative uh, studies, it is used to represent the L sound, for example, in Semitic languages when they borrowing words from Semitic. So, but I don't think the R itself is an L sound, even though that has been argued by some folks. So, um, let me, um, how do I stop? screen share and so um, i'm back here so peace to everyone thank you emmy cat for sharing the link to the book um if anyone has any you know other questions you know this would be a good time to ask and let me see anybody want to join the actual panel um, I put the link in the chat for those who want to, you know, join the panel and if you want to have a dialogue. So again, I don't have a lesson planned. It's just, you know, question and answer, you know, having a conversation about, um, the book itself, its contents and, you know, what should you expect? It says, do you believe in evolution? Um, it's not a matter of, do I believe in evolution? I accept evolution as a, um, a fact of science as a result of examining the, the fossil records and the genetic data, um, and the evidence that has been left by nature itself. So it's not an issue of me believing because in order for me to believe it in the, in the sense of like a religious faith. I would have to have no evidence for it. And so that is the exact opposite when it comes to uh, biological evolution. It is, there's nothing but evidence. And so anybody who deals with biology believes in, quote unquote, believes in evolution because evolution is the mechanism for change in nature. And so it's not an argument in science. It's not an issue of belief. Um, and so, uh, Let me add Brother Aoife Tunde in the mix. All right. Peace, peace. Peace, peace. There's a delay. The large screen, TV screen, and the phone here. All right. All right. So, so okay. I'm going through the book, book here, here to, to, you know, help drive our conversation. So, so let's see. The, the term, term net, net, uh, exists as, as far back as at least the, the old kingdom, kingdom or, or what we would call the first gold age. In what, what African, African language, language does nature survive of the top? Hold on, I'm sorry. I'm trying to experiment here so I can focus on you, but I don't know how to do that back here. Um, I didn't hear, I think when I pressed this button somewhere, it kind of it kind of clicked you off. So can you please repeat your question again? Okay, okay no problem. problem. So the so term nature, 
in the written form uh -huh. goes back as far as the old kingdom mm -hmm. otherwise called first kingdom and is used as late as the mock in the meta nature form the mock and what other hold on one second hold on one second um they're saying there's an echo um on my end well i can't hear it back here and i don't have my volume on on this other computer so i don't know how the echo is happening do you you said it you have it on the TV? Yeah, yeah I turned the turn volume, volume down. down on the TV. Is it a T is it is it another computer? Mm -hmm. I mean it's I mean, a it's smart, smart TV. TV. Well, let me turn it off. Well, I I'm trying to see cuz the only way that I can um think of um okay, how, how is that? Is that? So it's going to be it's a delay. So for those people who are in the um, the the live chat, let us know if it's still an echo. Testing, testing, one, two, one, two. One, two. Is there he an said the echo, echo is on your end. So let me let me do this. I'm a I'm a mute my mic while you're talking, and mm -hmm. you just say some random stuff and then ask them can they still hear the echo so i'm pressing my mute button now all right can y'all hear any echo sound on my end testing 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 if a tune day is present to ask questions and dialogue with the sorry imhotep this is your brother Sinjetti. Yeah, I can't see the chat on my end. So I don't know. They they're saying it's better. So when, when you're talking or when one of us is talking, I guess it's better for us to mute the mic. Um okay, okay. our mic while we're we're talking. So you're I'm sorry. I, I know I asked you to repeat this already, but please repeat your question. All right. So we know that the term "netcher" that's you that's usually translated as God, uh, divinity, principle, or power, is used in the written form as early as the Old Kingdom, an ancient kingdom, otherwise called the First Golden Age, and as late as uh, Dematic in regards to native comedic writing. In what languages does this term survive in Africa other than Kaka, which is also in Africa? Okay. Um, and so you, I guess when I'm talking, you'll have to mute your mic. Um, so it is the word Netcher survives in a number of languages in Africa. And so the we have to understand that there's three forms of the word netcher, even in the Egyptian language, as I discussed in the text. So you have the, the form that we all know is netcher. Then you have a form which we normally call ka. Uh, we transliterate k, lowercase k, and in capital A, for those who, you know, deal with the translation and transliteration of Meta Netra script, um, the Ka, and then we also have Iri. And so these are three different variations of the word, which of the word Netra, which is spirit or God or whatnot. And so with that said, there's a variety of, of pronunciations in African languages. So in Chiluba, you would say in or you would say 
in Kole or in Gole or in Gola. Um, that's one pronunciation. So that is more of the older pronunciation. Uh, the, the, the forms that have like Netcher, um, like with the, uh, the collagen language, they say net to or, or in West Africa, when they say in Toro in Ghana or Toro or Tro or Adro. These are variation. All of that is discussed. Some of it is discussed in the introduction. And then some of it is discussed in the the chapter on the etymology of the word Allah. Um, and so the word Allah derives from one of those variations of the word Netter. And I give the linguistic breakdown for that in chapter nine. So um, there's again, it's just a variety of, of forms and, you know, some have the KR root, like in Kere, in Koro, in Kashidic. And some have the in Toro, in, in, you know, in Tro variations or Troa as the plural uh, form. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's a variety, you know, of terms. And so what I ultimately argue is the origin of the word for for netter is that it comes from a root, uh, a consonant vowel root that means to make, to create, to exit from the self. And the prefix, which became fossilized in the word, uh, means to to throw, to, to make something happen. And so it becomes a noun, it becomes a word for power. Uh, one who could create or one who can make things happen. And so when you have the in in front of it is the N is a uh, prefix of agent. And so this prefix of agent um, makes it to that the word, you know that the word has to deal with a, 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 a an entity that has agency. So that's why the word netter can be applied to a quote unquote deity or a human being. So in, in Chiluba, for example, while in 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 Kole or in Quele can mean God, it can also mean a prominent um, a person, a person of statue, a person who has command to make things happen. So a netcher is is anybody who can create anything, um, who can build anything, someone who gives birth. So women in general who gives birth to human beings, or just somebody in an authoritative position who can command, you know, others to, to make anything happen. So anybody, so that's when you see a king being referred to as a netcher or a quote unquote God, it's not like in the sense of how we understand it because of our Christian and Muslim minds in 2020. It's just talking about someone who is of prominent stature, who has the command, who has the authority to, to make things happen in the kingdom. And so no other person is higher in the kingdom in those old days than the king itself. So the king has the authority to say, build this project, take this money and do this with it. Y'all go here and y'all fight these cats, you know, on the borders, et cetera, et cetera. So um, I, I hope I answered that question. I might, you know, uh, share my screen and so, so folks can see it. Okay. okay. So, in the in the Vodun tradition, uh, that comes, of course, out of uh, Benin, and then travels to uh, the Caribbean and the Americas. Uh, there's a tradition where. Uh, I'm going to call them, we'll just say shrine houses, uh, where a great person is buried. They place a, a white flag with, of course, upon a pole in that area, designating that this area uh, is for, to recognize a great person. It could be a priest or otherwise, someone of great stature. 
is present. So how how does that how might that relate to nature? Well, as discussed in the text, the the word nature is a variety of different words. And so there's a nature that has to deal with the concept of spirit and, you know, a prominent uh, person, a powerful person, an eminent and powerful person. And then there's a word for nature that means a pole or a stick. And then there's a word nature that has to deal with cloth. And so as I discussed in my 2016 text, Nesubiti, King and Ancient Egyptian, a lesson in paranomy and, um, and leadership, this concept of paranomy is so essential to understanding African religion, African culture and concepts. Because, because all three of those entities, the concept of a, uh, a powerful person or a god, a stick and a flag, because they're represented by the same consonant sequence, the ancient Egyptians or the, the, the Chiana into and Negro Egyptian speakers, they linked all three of these consonants together, uh, these concepts together, and um, by way of this, this thing called paronymy. So paronymy is this belief that words that sound the same must necessarily have a common origin and are related to each other. And it, it is paronymy that is the inspiration for a lot of the motifs that we see in African uh, religions and, and, and cultures and things of that nature. So this is no different. So the same way that you see the flags planted in front of a temple or whatnot, uh, signifying that this is a place of, of worship or where you can encounter or ask of God, it's the same thing when you uh, find the Babalawos, for example, in Yoruba land and in Benin. When they go to a place, they plant a they plant a stick in the ground with a white flag at the top that is called Necher, basically in their language. Because um, in 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 Yoruba, it's, it's it's Tala, Tala. They don't have the N prefix; they just say Tala. It's a word for white cloth. And so this is why this concept of paranimi, why Obatala is the king of the white cloth, even though the word Obatala is actually a, a, a sentence saying the, uh, or a phrase meaning the exalted king. They say word Tala that means um, exalted and Oba is a word for king. So Obatala is the exalted king. But because the word Tala sounds like the word Allah, which means white, and Tala meaning cloth, they linked all those things together. And this is why those uh, or, um, Ifa devotees who, who are under the head of Obatala have to wear white and why Obatala is considered the king of the white cloth. That all has to do with paranimi. So the same thing when it comes to this concept of nature, which is why the symbol is a a white cloth, you know, either wrapped around the pole um, or the stick, or it's hanging at the top of the stick. And so you find this not only in ancient Kemet, you find this in Benin, you find this in Yoruba land in Nigeria, you find this in the Congo, you find this in uh, Zimbabwe. And so I give those testimonies in the text. And so they're also, you know, um, dealing with the funerals, as you mentioned. And so it's still dealing with an, an ancestor, you know, those strips of cloth dealing with ancestors and spirit. And so the reason why you plant them on a pole, on a flag, is because the waving of the cloth symbolizes the, the presence of spirit. Because you know what spirit is, it's just wind or breath in many languages across the world. So it's an invisible force that is that is manipulating physical uh or you know uh manipulating the physical things in our normal everyday experience and so these are the symbolic connections to this and so that is what is discussed in the introduction um to this text dealing with the with the concept of nature and you know in those citations where you can find nature in west africa you know in those exact places 
where the the Africans were were taken and brought into the new world. And not only that, we brought the Netchers to the new world. And so they really survive amongst the voodoo practitioners in Haiti, and especially those of us who are from New Orleans, and especially for us who bring those um, umbrellas and flags and we put those strips of cloth on the side of the um, the umbrellas, you know, at the funerals. So we brought Netchers, Netcherus, and that philosophy and, and culture to the new world. And it's active still to this date in um, Louisiana, in New Orleans, in places like Haiti and South America, etc. So when people make these 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 erroneous things that there's no connection to uh, ancient Kemen in West Africa don't know their own history. And so I'll, I'll, I'll pause there. Oh, and before, before um, you come on, I know somebody asked the question, um, do I know the etymology of Olodumare? And I do know the etymology of Olodumare. And in my analysis of the word Allah in chapter nine, I think it's chapter, no, I deal with this in chapter eight on establishing the sound meaning correspondences. I show you where the word Ra is cognate with the word Mare in Olodumare. And so, at least linguistically, you can argue that Olodumare and, and, and the sun god Ra are the same thing. And so the word Mare in Olodumare um, is a word for shining and brilliance um, and things of that nature. Same thing with like Eshumare, um, which has to deal with the rainbow. It has to deal with the light and brilliance of the light. And so um, I discussed that again in chapter 8. Okay, so so basically, the flags that you see at the front of the Medic temples is really the same as the homes and, and, and areas that you see flags you see in West Africa and even um, in the Buddhist practices you find in the Caribbean and in the Western Hemisphere. Because a Medic temple or a, a Kurnetcher is essentially is a house. It's the same thing, it's just larger. So basically that, you're saying that that's a, basically the same thing. That a, that a shrine is, is essentially a house? Is that what you're asking? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's 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 exactly what it is. And so it's their own particular space because we always ask spirit to come down and dwell in the home or the sanctuary or something to this nature. So you give them a place to come. You know, it's like you're grounding the spirit, you know, in the in the place in which you're at. And so, um, yeah, so that's when you when you're thinking about the pyramids and and things of that nature. Those are just big shrines you know, for, for the ancestor to come and live and dwell and to do their spirit work, you know, on behalf of the community. And so you'll find these, these pyramid shaped, um, shrines, you know, all over Africa. And so in, as I showed in the West Africa, uh, what was it? Um, the, the West Africa and ancient Egypt lecture that I did last week, um, you find that same, you find those shrines in, in uh, Igbo land and you find them in Ghana. You know, they're just, they're just places for spirit to come dwell. Um, and so I think, I think the inspiration comes from both a combination of ant hills and um, mountains because mountains or mountainous places is where a lot of, um, uh, people were buried but in some regions they they look at them from the standpoint of of, of ant hills so if you look at an ant hill and how it's shaped like a mound or a pyramid or whatnot you know 
it looks like there's nothing there, but if you was to kick or poke a hole in the in the mound, that's when a whole bunch of ants and stuff come from the quote unquote underworld. So the, it, it's the same thing as symbolic. So that 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 underworld is where the quote unquote ants and stuff live, um, the the spirit world. So um, it becomes symbolic. So this is we're putting people back in the ground, back into the 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 ant mounds um and so you know it, it's a it's a whole uh human you know african you know saying human connection you know uh that we made you know extra super large for some reason uh in ancient kemet so hold on uh, can you think of an instance of paranormal we kept with us here in in north america um, not necessarily like, it just depends on, you know, uh, who, who you talk, I mean, not in a sense of, of culture, like, like what we did in Africa, but you, you'll see it in a sense, like, for example, with folk etymology, like I used to hear back in the day that a Negro can only go as high as his Negroes, you know? You know, and so for people who like to, you know, kind of dehumanize black folks and call them Negroes. So Negroes are less than, you know, the true black man, so to speak. So like if, if you are Negro minded, this is what they're addressing. So a Negro can only go as high as his Negroes. So the word Negro or Negro is a Spanish word for or a Latin word for black. But me and grows are two separate English words. But because if you put knee and grows together, it sounds like the word Negro. And so now that phrase has been joined together and it's made this kind of idiom, uh, so to speak. So uh, that's an immediate example that I can think of. But that's not necessarily culture in the sense where, where we, we made like symbols and stuff attached to it, like like we did in Africa with um, with the with the concept of nature and and the flagpole and things of that nature. Um, here's an example. So in the Fon language, coming out of Benin and the surrounding areas, one of the words for spirit is Lua. And those who were, pra were practicing Benin Vodun, of course, you're bringing that language over into Haiti, uh, Cuba, the surrounding islands, and, and even in the United States. But in the Francophone uh, country, especially Haiti, what, the word for law in French is a similar sound, loa. Uh, pardon me for French speakers if I'm mispronouncing that. So they do the, they did a paranomy with between the French term for law and the word for spirit in font. So, you know, they, they combined it to, to help support the ideal of spirit. So Lua or Luo in Fawn is conceptually equivalent to which you might think of in Netcher or in Arisha. But as far as the paranomy, that's an example. Of course, French is not di not directly related to the Fon language in West Africa. But that's an example of people taking words that sound similar and merging them together for um, a greater, a broader concept, especially when it comes to deities uh, or anything of such. I don't know if you want to elaborate, sir. Yeah, we got to remember that people weren't uh, historical comparative linguists back in the day. So they couldn't break down the terms and know that this is a separate word and that or this is an unrelated word. And so we got to also remember that Africans, they have a bias towards synthesis. They're they're consciously looking for patterns in nature and synthesizing those uh those things that appear to be related 
and using them, utilizing that knowledge in creative ways so that they keep it in memory. So this is how this synthesis becomes part of the culture, you know. And so, the, you know, the they don't have dictionaries either. So this is how they keep the the dictionary, like you know, the living dictionaries. Basically, is in the myths, is in the clothing, is in the artwork, etc. And so this is how they keep the knowledge that they've accumulated over the years. And and paranimi has been a very um, critical force uh, for a, a, a critical, yeah, force and inspiration for culture itself. So I put the, the, I think I can only have like five or six people, you know, in, in the, um, in the back chat so if anybody wants to come in the back chat uh or on the panel i should say i put the link in the chat so let me see if anybody else has any uh questions um doesn't seem to be any questions never mind you answered me um soul pick home i don't know what that means um so uh, I know there's going to be a delay. So if anybody has any other questions, we've been on for one hour and 51 minutes. Um, if there's anything that you want to talk about or you have any, you know, insight or questions, anything, I'll let you go. I mean, that was that. I mean, I, I mean, I definitely appreciate the, you know, you opening it up for questions whatnot. Um, I mean, my questions, you know, were purposed to, you know, really drive more conversation and perhaps maybe answer some questions and address things that people may not have heard explained, you know, or they may find interesting that may answer some other questions that they may have or have thought about. Um, so, you know, hopefully, you know, that helped people, help the listeners and those listening in the archive. Uh, I appreciate the conversation and especially the linguistic chart in, you know, on how you add it, uh, you know, as even if they're minor, but significant uh, modifications to the Boley's model. And, you know, but we're dealing, we're dealing with updated information in live time, you know, so really hope that people can appreciate that. And, you know, you know brother, sorry, he has, a, he has a brilliant mind. And, you know, he's somebody that's worthy to follow, you know, and, and drive conversation and, and help other people figure out things and bring that to the table and dialogue about it, you know. And it's all about raising the standard on the, the grassroots or the basic level. The basic level of understanding, you have to raise that bar. And that's what this is all about, you know using critical thinking to drive this rather than uh, say surface dialogue or what you might call it folk etymology or things that are not well thought out. You know, we want to bring that to a minimum really, you know, to eliminate that um, or which might call it intellectual laziness. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, um, yeah, because there's there's a lot of folks who, you know, haven't read and understood the works of Obinga and the works of Jean Claude and Boley, who think that we're just parroting Jean Claude and Boley. Like anything that Mboli says, we just automatically accept it without putting certain things through the test or modifying it as. Um, need be, but anybody who has read both Mboli's work and mine's will know that there are certain things that I disagree with him on, and where I make suggestions, uh, and and I have my reasons for the suggestion. So, like me changing the the name of Negro Egyptian um, to Chiena into is because of you know, especially here in the, in the West, that the word Negro is has a um 
a negative connotation. And also it is an unscientific term uh, for classification because Obinga makes a statement about, you know, kind of the, the racist aspect of Afro-Asiatic or Hamido-Semitic. But then he comes around and renames his language family one with a, with a racial color term. So, you know, to alleviate that, that, that hypocrisy, um, this is one of the reasons why I named it Chien Into. And so I give a whole explanation in the introduction. Um, and so for, for my text, you'll, you'll understand it as uh, Chien Into. But if you read in Boli and even his upcoming work, it's still going to be Negro Egyptian. So, um, but with that said, someone asked the question, um, uh, when is the dictionary coming out? So the dictionary that, that he's talking about is this text here. Towards, uh, towards a comparative dictionary of Chikam, which is Egyptian, and modern African languages. Uh, Egyptian, Chibantu, Yoruba, Kalajan, Sumerian, and Marotic. So initially this book was supposed to come out in January with the uh, Aluja Volume 2 book. However, at the last, the very last minute, I decided to include another chapter in this text dealing with the etymology of the word God in English and its African origin. And so the, and I also was adding some stuff. So there's a chapter in here where I'm comparing the Sumerian language with the Marotic language, uh, or at least the vocabularies, the decipher vocabularies that we have of Marotic. And so uh, that's this chapter here, chapter three. Uh, and so I've added some more stuff into that. And the chapter that I'm including in the text is going to be, uh, is currently right now being reviewed by a number of linguists. Um, so I wanted to have some some other linguistic eyes to look at the text before I included it in this text. So I don't have an exact release date. I want to hopefully release it at the end of March, um, but it just depends on when they give me uh, their feedback. And so you got to understand that, you know, professors, they have their own workload. So they have grades you know, curriculum and stuff that they have to deal with, as well as their own, you know, uh, scholastic projects and stuff like that. So I give it a little time. So the the African origin of the um, the word God, uh, a new linguistic analysis is going to be included, you know, in this text. So that's the holdup. So there are people who have pre-ordered this. Um, so just letting y'all know that this is the, um, that's the latest, so look for it probably coming at the end of March. Uh, but, you know, that that final chapter is being reviewed now by a number of linguists. So I got to take their, uh, their criticisms into consideration and so that, you know, when you get it, it is a, a good product. Uh, but this is the text, so you can still pre-order it on my website and, you know, once it comes out, you'll be with it. And so some of these, like two of these chapters, the one on Marotic and Sumerian and the one on um, testing in Boley's uh, Negro Egyptian uh, semantic map, those were originally supposed to be included in Illusion Volume 2, but because of printing constraints, um, I had to take those chapters out. So I took those chapters out and put it in here and now I'm adding this other one. So it'll be all new um, stuff. So if you get both of those books, you'll, you'll be good for the year. Um, and if you haven't gotten already, you know, uh, go to Amazon.com and, you know, purchase your copy of A Contributions to the Debate on the Meaning of the Place Name Kemet by the Shimsu Heru Research Team, which is myself. Brother Sanjeti, a.k.a. Ifatunde Fayemi, 
and Brother Bujawu Eri Ma'at of the Amin Ra Squad. So, I hope I answered that question. Um, the language of Moreau, yes, the language of Moreau, that's Marotic. Um, hold on. Is the word nature the foundation for the word nature, even though the words have different forms? No, the word nature and the word nature um, have different etymologies. But that would be a good uh, example of paronymy. And so people, because nature and nature sound alike even though we don't know exactly how nature was pronounced in ancient egyptian but the way that we pronounce it today they sound close enough and they're conceptually close enough that we would automatically think that um they belong together so you know you have certain people say that nature is nature and this is where the word nature comes from without doing any kind of linguistic analysis and so uh no so, Okwami Osei has a book called The African Origins of the English Language. That's uh, Brother Dr. Jahi Issa, uh, who's making that um, statement. I haven't heard of it, but um, I don't know about the English language per se, and, and not directly, but definitely there is African there's an African influence in the formation of Proto-Indo-European, which gives birth to Proto-Germanic, which gives birth to the English language. And so there are a lot of English words that ultimately have an African origin. And so that very word God that I'm talking about has an African origin. And I can tell you right now that the word God is cognate with the word nature. And this is going to be very controversial for a lot of folks because they believe that you can't use the word God to define the word detcher when they're both cognate terms. So, you know, more of that, the proof of that will be in this text uh, when it comes out in March. So, um, so yeah, you have any comment? Um, yeah, just, uh, earlier regarding you know the, the works of you know the scholars that we read know that we do read these things in detail uh and again we don't just parrot you know the ideas but you know we use you know updated information etc like uh for example we read a lot of the the uh, of jokes works like this is his linguistic book right here you know like we have access we read we read these things uh, so this is class in the seven book here. Uh Plenty Genetic, uh Daily Egyptian Negro African um African. Um so this is the the genetic relationship of uh Pharaonic Egyptian and Black African languages, nineteen seventy seven. So, you know, we didn't just uh come out of the blue with critiques or anything like that. We read these things. Um, in regards to Binga, you know, we do, you know, we have this 1983 Mr. book. All of us have this. Um, this one is uh, Origin Commune, Daily Egyptian Ancient Greek Quartet. It just ain't good. Negro after comma, didn't it? Um, so hopefully I pronounced that right. Um, the common origin of ancient Egypt uh, uh, Coptic and of uh, uh, modern Black African languages. So we have that. Um, we have books like this. The Abu Bukhim Muslim. Le Chemins du Nil. So the Pathways of the Nile. So we, you know, we're, we're reading, we're reading these things. Um, I haven't read through this one yet, but you know, it's a little by uh, Omega. Uh, well, I'm not gonna mess with the. the pronunciation, but it means that the meaning of the fight against uh, Eurocentric Africanism, Africanism. So, yeah, so we, we are reading these things. And it, it, it takes a lot of effort, you know, we got to learn how to read another language to, to read 
such books and research. So, a lot of effort being put in. So. Someone asked a question. Are there any connections with Metternature and Sumerian? And my answer to that is, I make that argument all throughout the Luja volume two. And, you know, I'll just show on, you know, a, a screenshot, just, you know, uh, just some of these connections. And if y'all been paying attention to any of my YouTube videos and arguments, you've seen some of these before, but this is where um, I have them in, you know, the actual text. And there's a lot more just, just throughout the entire uh, text. Hold on, let me make sure that I make this a big screen. Okay, boom. So that y'all can see but, you know, not only do I show connections between Sumerian and Egyptian, which I call Chikam after Dr. Muba Binge Bilolo, but I show Sumerian and Proto-Bantu and also Sumerian and Collagen. So, you like, when you look at this top row, for example, Proto-Bantu, Bodhi Ud, Pierce or Hole. Barud in Sumerian, breach, hold, Perf uh, perforate. And then you have Beri, hold in Egyptian. Badud, split, burst, open. Bar, cut open, slit, split. Ber, to hack up the earth, to open up. Weber, to open, to drill, into stone. Bud, goat. Barangal, or Barsal, sheep. Bear, ram. These are all domesticated cattle. They're all pretty much the same in that same category. And so we can do, we can do this all day between Proto Bantu, Sumerian, and Egyptian. And as I said, I do the same thing with, um, with collagen. You know, Elena, which is a so-called nilotic language. And so you'll find those in, like, right here. Like proto bantu, cod or sod, incise, cut or tattoo, Sumerian, sar to write, collagen, sir, write, authors, sada, field, sar, garden plot, sernit, kitchen garden, small garden near the home, cod, hurry, sar, run, hasten, sar, hurry, taste, seri, serin, run about, bustle about. And so you got to pay attention to the patterns of the sound correspondences between these languages. And so I put the sound correspondences in this last row. And so I do this to demonstrate that Sumerian is an African language. And it was because of Africans moving out into, um, where do I have that, that map? I may have been before here. Let me double check. Um, no, no, it's further down. Uh, just to show the map of the Shina into, aka Negro Egyptian map, where you can see the. Hold on, is it? Nope, nope. Did I not have this in here? Uh, Y'all excuse me for a second while I try to find this visual for y'all. Um, and see, this is interesting here because I, I'm showing the relationship between the Egyptian classifiers known as the determinatives also with the Sumerian. So the Sumerian and the Egyptian have the same classifiers or determinatives in their language and in the writing script. And so the, the book is chock full of information that is going to take a while for 
people to kind of digest. This is the map that I was looking for. So, you know, we're arguing that, you know, uh, Negro Egyptian or China into begins over here near the Great Lakes region and it spreads out. So Chi Bantu and, you know, it spreads into the Sudan and from the Sudan, you get Hassa, Zande, Bambara, Middle Egyptian and Sumerian. And Sumerian comes through the Nile Valley and migrates in this area. And so some of the Proto-Sumerians are the those Negro Egyptian speakers or China Intu speakers who interacted here in the Levant and created Proto-Semitic. While some further went up over here into Anatolia and into the steeps over here, it created um, and helped to create and converge with um, pre proto or Proto-Indo-European. So this is why you will find a whole bunch of inherited words in Proto-Indo-European and uh, uh, these African languages because of this, this model. Uh, we argue that this model is accurate to history and we give different reasons why. So, um, so to answer your question, yes. Uh, I, I demonstrate conclusively that there's a relationship between uh, Egyptian and Sumerian and Sumerian with Egyptian collagen and Bantu and because Sumerian belongs to the China into language family as a as a better language, a better batch language. So I hope I answered that uh, question. Dr. Issa says that he'll be in Ghana next week. And he will bring back a few copies of that English, the African origins of the English language. So I will look forward to uh, purchasing a copy from you and and examining the merits of uh, Dr. Ose, uh, Brother Osei's um, argument. He says, this is a question I have always wondered and you two are linguists. Do you think there is such a thing as proper English? Um, no, there is not there, you know, in linguistics, you have this concept called descriptive linguistics and prescriptive linguistics. Descriptive linguistics is what linguistics is. All a linguist does is describe how uh, a language is organized and how people use it. And so the prescriptive is more so like your English teacher. Your English teacher tell you that you're not saying something right or you're not saying something proper. That's a social thing that has has nothing to do with linguistics itself. So you have, you know, dialects and then you have dialects that are, how should I say, that are that are propped up because they there's a, a, a social prestige to it. So if you're not speaking the Queen's English, that dialect of English, then you're allegedly speaking bad English. That's a social thing that has nothing to do with actually speaking. A language, all that matters in a language is that if a one person is speaking, if person A is speaking to person B, and person B understands person A, then they're communicating. That's the whole purpose of language is to communicate. If there is a whole group of individuals who understand person A, then they speak properly, you know, their language. Because no one actually speaks a language. A language is a kind of summary of what they call idiolects. So every person speaks an idiolect of a language. And a, and, a, and a linguist studies all of the idiolects that individual peoples speak and, and try to come to co some consensus as to how the collective, the collective rules for how everyone in this particular geographical region understands each other. So, but you'll never know all the words in a language. You never know, you never speak it the exact same. No one speaks the exact same. You know, the the you you when we pronounce, when we make an argument that that this is how the word is pronounced in the language, 
is, is really kind of an idealized pronunciation of terms because someone in another region may pronounce it different because of the way that their dialect is or just the individual person, how they speak. So you're when you're dealing with language and linguistics, you're kind of dealing with a summarization, an idealization of the language. But in, in reality, you know, there's no such thing as proper English um, in, in, the, in, the, in the strictest sense. You know, only English that is understood by English speaking people. That's that's all it really is. Let me see. Oh, oh real quick. quick. Uh, also, also uh, for those who may not know um, what an idiolect is, you know, an idiolect is the speech habits or the speech patterns of a particular group or, or person. So that's what an idiolect is. <clears throat> All right. Someone asked the question or make the statement. Um, it's commonly thought that Sumer had the oldest written language. What are your thoughts? I, I don't believe that that is the case. Um, all evidence points to ancient Egypt having the oldest written language. And then second comes Sumer. But either way it goes, these are still, you know, African people who uh, created these writing systems. And, uh, but because of the area in which the, 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 the people of Sumer were in, they were absorbed by genetically, biogenetically, by the dominant quote unquote race of people around there. So by the time you start getting these pictures and things of the people, they start to look different, like a, like a mixed race and almost like, um, like an Arab, you know, Jewish looking type people because they were absorbed by the Semitic speaking people, but their, their culture was the dominant, uh, in that area until the, the Semites fully took over sooner, um, in like the second, uh, millennium BC. Um, let me help elaborate on that question in regards to whether writing comes out of Sumer whether it's Sumer or Kemi. And the claim that people in Western Asia or in the Levant brought writing to Kemi. Well, here's something to think about. If you take an inventory of the written signs of such metonetric or what you would call an ancient Egyptian hierarchy, uh, especially in the Middle Kingdom and the Old Kingdom. And you look at the animals, look at the type of animals that are present. Look at the, the wildlife. You want to look at the birds. And then you want to look at where these animals are. Granted, there could have been differences, you know, say three, four thousand years ago. But you can study where animals are native to, such as lions, uh, giraffes, etc. All the, these are present in metanetra or such metanetra. And look at the domestic life, tools, uh, houses, modes of transportation, uh, writing tools, utensils, etc. Uh, carpentry, uh, tools and apparatuses. And then you look at Sumeria. What kind of things were there? If Sumerians brought writing from Western Asia, or really we just say people in Western Asia brought writing to Kemet, then we will see that reflected in the signs. However, when we look at Kemet or such mother nature, the signs do not, the early signs, especially from the middle and the old kingdom, do not reflect this. You don't really see horses in Meta Nature until later on in its history. Where horses, even though African people are aware of horses, uh, but they were, in, at least in Kemet, they were not as prominent until uh, after, well, during the 
what's called the second intermediate period and moving forward into the new kingdom, so on and so forth. So these are some things to think about. Indeed. Um, someone asked, did Sumerians get along well with the Akkadians? Um, I think there probably was a time that they got along well, but then, you know, the Akkadians were a colonial force and took over Sumer. And so I'm, I'm pretty sure that a colonial force uh, is not looked upon well by the native folks. So... It just depends. It's just like with the Nubians, so-called Nubians, or the uh, the Kushites or the Wawat, you know, folks, that they got along with the Egyptians sometimes, and sometimes they didn't. And so it just depends on what time in history you're talking about. So, someone, uh, Brother Aziz, says you got to know some secret glyphs to get that book. <laughs> the Diop book. Um, yeah, yeah, that's, that's pretty, pretty much, much what happened. happened. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, they be trying to hide Diop's book. Um, yeah, yeah, it took me a long time. It took me a long time to get that. I, I had to call France to get it. And when I did, uh, they only had one copy. You know, so it's funny because that story I had wrote down a whole French dialogue, you know, and what the possible responses would be in that conversation and what and how I would answer. You know, so it took me like I think like two hours, you know, trying to write down French phrases and listening to the phrases to make sure I'm pronouncing them right. And and you know, whatever the responses would be, listening to those so I can remember. Yeah, it took me a while. And then when I called and started with my phrases, I think I, I was getting it right for the first two minutes. And then, then the guy, the, the brother, realized that I was pronouncing everything like I was an English speaker. And he started speaking English to me. <laughs> I'm like, oh. You know, his, um, he was a manager there. His name is Ben. I don't know if he still works there now brother he's from Senegal real good brother uh, we had a really good conversation his name is Ben and uh, yeah I was able to get the only copy they had at that time so yeah other than that I mean I was having some elders have a conversation with people somewhere in West Africa some some brother had happened to have a copy somewhere that lived in one of the in some city in like Mali something. I was like, look, I'll, I'll pay you for it. And then end up getting a little story. Yeah, it's hard to get some of these books um, over here from the French-speaking Africans. But um, anybody have any... I put the link in the... Well, I put two links in the chat. One is, of course, to the book which is under discussion right now, which is Aluja Volume 2, Cheating Into Religion and Philosophy, and um, a link to anybody who wants to join the panel. Um, I think we have like four more slots. So um, it's, it's there if you want to brave it and come on the panel. Uh, again, there's no real focus on this particular lecture because it's not a lecture. It's just a a discussion in the book so you know for those who have the book if if you gotten to a point where you um uh you know can understand and have any questions um you know this is a a, a good opportunity to uh, you know ask questions and, and so i as i stated at the beginning of the program that I will be doing this at the towards like the last week of the next four or five months so that, uh, you know, as people are continuing to reading, you know, and they have any questions, this would just be a good opportunity to have a live 
so that you know I may be able to answer any questions that you have concerning the text um, or whatnot. So you know, there's just I don't I don't have any slides or anything to that nature. Just uh, you know, question and answer for those who who um, have gotten the text or those who are interested in the text and and want to know more about it. So this is a, a good opportunity to interact, you know, with everyone. So um, before we move on, I want to say peace to Brother Ujawu, uh, who has joined the panel. Uh, please introduce yourself and say anything you need. Peace, all right, peace to you, Asar. Peace, uh, Sanjeti. Uh, this is the um, Shimsu Heru research team right here now. <laughs> uh, no, I'm just now jumping out. I tried it. I was tuned in earlier, but I was on the go. So I just caught a, a, like a real brief. So I'm just now tuning back in. So I don't really know what was discussed and everything. But um, I do want to say congratulations on the release of your book. I never had a chance to congratulate you on the release of it and um and and the fact that a lot of people are getting it and and learning a lot of, a lot from it and that's what i like to see so just want to say congratulations with you on that and it's gonna take me a little time to to um really digest for me to um pick your brain with uh some of the different information in different chapters but yeah so that's um that's pretty much it i'll just fall back and see what you're all talking about I appreciate it. Appreciate it. Um, and tell them about uh, your text. Better fact, both of y'all are coming out with texts. Hopefully, uh, this year, um, it, um, at least by the end of the year. I know you said yours is going to be in April, brother Ujawa. So, if you can um, talk about your upcoming text, and then brother Sanjeti, uh, you talk about your upcoming text after brother Ujawa. Okay, yeah, I appreciate it. Um, <clears throat> well, I do have upcoming text. It's long overdue for me. Um, my personal uh, goal <laughs> was to have it out before now, but um, it looks like it'll be out by April. And um, and it's the title of it is The Ancient Egyptian Orthography and Grammar, First Edition, a Synchronic Descriptive Grammar of the Older Speech of Kemet. And so on the cover that you see here on the screen, it, you see uh, Seshmetu Netcher, which is the writing system, and then Rani Kemet, which is the language. And for those who know or who may have um, been interested in learning language, when you learn this particular language, ancient Egyptian language, you're learning two things at once. And you have to, you have to really master the writing system before you can move on to a full grammatic, uh, a full analysis of the grammar. And so that's the way I set up my, my classes in, in two levels, a beginner's level and then a level dealing with the grammar. And so um, the goal of the beginners is to master all aspects of, of the writing system, um, you know, the glyphs, how they can function, and all the ins and outs of that with just a little bit of grammar, but then level two, so to speak, would be uh, full analysis of the grammar. So this is my upcoming text to uh, look out for and I'll be announcing it when I get closer to the to the date. And it's, it's I wrote it as a textbook, so it's going to contain all of the beginner's information as well as the full grammar. So this will be like a one-stop shop um, book for those who even are interested in teaching. Hopefully, um, you know my book will be uh, utilized in teaching, and you know I'm doing my best to write it that way so that everybody can uh, benefit from it. But yeah, so look out for it. Uh, somewhere around April. Okay. Uh, and my text is on Patahotep. So the translation itself is already completed. And so now I'm uh, adding, you know, some, some context to it. Um, you know, some literary comparisons. And this text, it, it is a dedication uh, to uh, the, that great ancestor scholar, uh, Asa Hilliard, you know, and he's done a translation of that work. So this is a continuation and an elaboration, you know, uh, and building upon 
previous ones. You know, we're just we're simply adding to it. So this this would be a, a new translation. Much of it will be similar to previous ones, with uh, you know slight modifications, but it all means the same uh, in regards to the translation itself, and then adding a context, you know, to it, and uh, and some imagery. So that'll be out this year. But again, the translation itself is already finished. Kubanes. I uh, appreciate that. And um, so we have a few questions here. One from Asiatic Black Man 19. Does the animal and plant life on stele and various stone monuments, I assume, give us a map or directionality in some instances? Um, I don't quite understand your question. Um, is there a way you can kind of reword it? Uh, so it would be a little bit more clear to me. So uh, either I or someone on this panel can answer your question uh, more adequately. Um, Africa Plug asks, why you got white fingers on the book, though? Um, I assume that's directed to Brother Wujawu. Uh Why you got white fingers, I don't even know, understand what that uh, is even supposed to mean. So if you want to address that. <laughs> sure, sure. Um, if you look at the book very good, um, these fingers are very far from being white. It looks white because it's on a white background and the picture is faded. But that's actually a squatting or seated scribe who is actually writing and performing sesh. So that is the actual remage scribe, uh, sesh person. And if it wasn't faded, it would be, you know, the, the normal standard reddish brown pigment uh, that you see. It's only white because it's faded. So hopefully I satisfied that. I think he was playing, but, you know. You never oh, know okay, yeah. <laughs> Uh, you know, we get we get attacked for using the white man science, so that that could be part of that as well. But um, someone asks, uh, Mara Marabontus, uh, and I know I'm just murdering that name. I've been doing it all night. Do the Khoisan people have a written text of their language? To my knowledge, no. They're a hunter gatherer people, and you know the the people who have written about their language and things of that nature are foreigners and so you have some people who can write now as, as far as Khoisan people especially in uh, South Africa who are educated in university systems but they use the standard you know English language and Latin letters that we do but um, but as far as like an indigenous script to my knowledge uh, I have yet to come across an indigenous, excuse me, an indigenous Khoisan um, script. And we got to remember that Khoisan is just a, a non-genetic group of, of languages that are grouped together based on the presence of the cliques in the language. So it's, it's not a singular group in, the, in, the, in a strictest sense. Only They're only grouped together because they have cliques in their languages. But... You know, for those linguists who have examined those languages, they they argue that they're not related, uh, or at least closely related, uh, by any stretch of the imagination. So, uh, we got to keep that in mind. So, um, are there any other questions in the chat? I do have I a have question. question. All right. Um, this was asked a few times in the past. And um, I don't know if it has changed. Someone had asked me, and I told them that I would I would ask you or for them to tune in, you know, to the show. But I don't see them tuned in. They may be tuned in. But the question was, or is, in in terms of Middle Egyptian, what scholars are calling Middle Egyptian, what is the closest uh, African language to that that you've uh, come across? 
in terms of, I guess, the general, I guess it would be, you know, lexicon, grammar, overall, the closest related one. Um, I don't know if there's necessarily a closest because this is something that, um, how should I say? I think that there needs to be more work done on identifying what exactly is Middle Egyptian because Middle Egyptian carries with it a number of doublets in the language and sometimes triplets in the language. So just as I said before, the word nature, I don't know if you was on the line when, when I made this uh, comment, but the word nature has three variations in the language. That is nature, that is the word we pronounce as ka, which is really ker or ker, um, and the word iri. All three of those are different variations of the same word. And all of them result from a different um, series of sound changes. So the K in ker or ka um, palatalizes and becomes ch in nature. But the dialect that has the ka does not have the n prefix um, grammatical feature. Like you don't see in Egyptian in ker as, as a dominant you know, form as you would in the other African languages. And so this is this is telling that what we're calling Middle Egyptian in Old Kingdom Egyptian has borrowed a lot of terms from other surrounding African languages. And so when someone asks that question, what is closer to Middle Egyptian in terms of lexicon and such of this nature, it's really kind of hard to answer. Because are we talking about the words that were naturally inherited into the Egyptian language? Or, you know, or are we talking about that including the possible borrowings that are in the language? Because if you examine, you know, one language with Egyptian, it'll seem like they match a lot of words, but the doublets, they won't match necessarily. But if you match another language, they may match the doublets closer than they do the other variants that are in the language. So you may have languages that have the word netter, but they won't have the equivalent ka or the equivalent iri in the language. And so this is why I'm saying that there needs to be a, a more detailed study on the formation of Middle Egyptian because uh, there's a lot going on with, with that uh, variant of the language that needs to be cleared out. So I hope that answered the question even though I didn't answer the question. <laughs> <laughs> no, nah, probably. probably. So, so that's... that's but um I'm not seeing any more questions in the in the chat and you know unless y'all have something you know that y'all want to say um you know I, I don't have anything else and so um you know not like so I see you've been on for two hours already, so yeah. <laughs> I don't want to rehash something I just missed, but I'll, I'm going to check the uh, recording out. But yeah, I, I, I'm glad that you joined these uh, Eluja Q&As and, and the lessons. I guess one, two. Yeah, two or three. I'm on, what is this, three? This is three? Yeah. And I, and I shouldn't even label it three since it was just really kind of a and a I should have labeled it Q&A one. You know, illusion Q and A one, and then 
go on from there. And then the lessons be the actual lessons, you know. Um, <clears throat> so right. I asked the question, where, are the or where is the origin of the Bantus? So we, we have to, and this is a hard question to, to answer because of the ambiguity of the term Bantu and who it's actually applied to and who you're talking to. If you're talking to the standard linguist who is under the the Greenberg, who believes in the Greenberg model of language classification in Africa, the Bantu speakers, and we got to remember that Bantu is a language classification. It is not a biological classification um, in, in, in Africa. So there's, there's no connection of between biology and, and language. So it's just a, a language classification that is really kind of grouped together based on topological features. And so, and some, you know, com some common, you know, noun classifiers and, and vocabulary. And so, you know, the, the reconstruction of, for example, like verb forms is, is, has yet to be done. You know, like a full analysis of a proto-Bantu has yet to be done. And so, but there's certain characteristics of it that is fairly common amongst speakers who exist in, you know, the geographical spaces of Cameroon um, to Kenya to down to South Africa in Zululand. So, but these characteristics are also present in, for example, the Gabaya language or in ancient Egyptian itself, just in a reduced form. And so the, hold on one second, I'm, I'm going to share my screen again. Um, And I'll go there and do that. We're going to go back to Mboli's model of Negro Egyptian. And uh, let me go back up. That we, what page was that on? Let me preface. Uh, hold on one sec. No, 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 no. Let me go back up. Uh, here we go. So, um, if we remember from our earlier conversation, and peace to uh, Brother Ramesu, who um, has provided a donation. Thank you very much. <clears throat> um, hold on. Uh, where was I? Okay, so remember that this is the updated Negro Egyptian model, uh, or yeah, model schema for the language family of Negro Egyptian according to Jean-Claude Mboli. Now, what I have done is modified in name only certain layers of his Negro Egyptian classification. So I renamed Negro Egyptian archaic to Chiankanda Chikulu, which you see at the top here. And his Negro Egyptian post classic stage is what I renamed Chiana into. <clears throat> and so, as I stated before, you have Chianconda Chikulu. This is the, the primal language that existed for this particular family. This language broke off into three branches. So we have branch one, branch two, 
and Branch 3. And they are they are distinguished by where the accent falls on the syllable. So it it went about a consonant vowel consonant vowel structure. So these are two different words um, that are agglutinated to or combined to create a bigger or larger concept. So the in branch one, the con the accent falls on the first syllable. In branch two, the accent falls on the second syllable. So you'll see these little accent marks on here. And in branch three, uh, it is on the first syllable as well, but it loses, branch three actually loses the accent in the next stage. So branch one becomes what we call kikwe, because the again um, this is the formation of the word so you have let's say this word kikwe here or it's actually kikuki which you see here that has formed into kikwe because of the the accent and how that affects the loss of the the final syllable or, or com combination and things this is kind of beyond the scope of this but i just want to mention this distinction so kikwe, kweki, and kweki is just the word kikwe, but the syllables have been reversed. So ki, and then kwe, now kwe, and ki. Now, this didn't have the accent on any of the three combinations, the trisyllable words. So it didn't lose, because all of these were really trisyllables at some point, but because of the accent, it lost one of the syllables in both the kikwe and kweki group. So now the standard word formation is consonant, vowel, consonant, uh, vowel for the kikwe and kweki group. But in the kikuki, it remained a consonant, vowel, consonant, vowel, consonant, vowel. So that, you know, we have this formation to kind of give a sense of that, um, that formation of the words. So the Kikwe and the Kweki group, as I mentioned before, they start interacting with each other for a very long time. And this group of these two groups of languages, because of their interactions for the long period of time in the same area for, you know, a couple thousands of years, their what was separate you know, and distinguishable between the two were no longer distinguishable. They all, you know, had the same features and they're borrowing the same words, you know, because of intermarriages, maybe wars, a whole bunch of possible reasons for how this happened. But because they've been living in the same area around the Great Lakes region for such a long time, they, their languages started to interact. I mean, they started to sound alike. So this concept is called convergence. And so this convergence process births a new language family. And so that's why we call it Chin and Intu. The Kikuki group interacts with the Chin and Intu after Chin and Intu forms, but not as, not as great, not until later on in a different geographical area. But, um, so this Chin and Intu is really Proto-Bantu or pre-Proto-Bantu. And Proto-Bantu gives birth to pre-Proto-Bantu, or I mean, gives birth to pre-Proto-Bantu or, or what we call, I call Chi-Bantu in the actual text. But Bantu is, is this Bere dialect. So the Chiena Intu breaks up into two distinct two distinctive dialects, the Bere dialect and the Beher dialect. And so the Bere dialect consists of the Hausa language, Zande, Middle Egyptian, and Bantu, because their words still remain consonant vowel, consonant vowel. However, the Beher dialect, because of the non-accentuated suffixes, 
it changes the format of how words are pronounced. So theirs have a bias towards words that have consonant, vowel, vowel consonant forms. So that's what you see here, C, V, V, C, consonant, vowel, vowel, consonant. So remember, this beher and this word bere is the same word, but they're from two different branches of chin and into. So this branch, this word for kebed is the same word. The, the BD in kebed is the beher word or bere word for liver. But because the Kikuki branch has a, a tendency towards triliterals, they have a prefix that remained in, in this branch. So that's why it's kebed in Arabic for liver. So this is a word for liver in Somali. And this is a word for liver, I think, in Zande. So... Um, so I'm saying all this to say that the Chiena Intu, it is, it is essentially Bantu. All of these are Bantu languages. But what we're calling Bantu in the modern times is a type of Bantu. That's why I call it Chibantu. But all of these are Intu languages. That's why I named it Chiena Intu. Because pre-Proto-Bantu or Proto-Bantu is representative of this stage of the language family. So all of these are into languages. So I say into Hasa, into Zande, into Middle Egyptian, into Coptic, into Sango, into Somali. But when we call Chibantu, is those those particular languages that you find primarily in Central Africa. Um, in South Africa and, and going into Cameroon. And so this is this is a different variation of so now I'm 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 honing in right here to this area of Chin and into in this next um uh, variation of the thing. So the post classic Chin and into or just Chin and into itself again, breaks up into two branches, the Bere branch and the Behir branch. And I, you won't see this in the book because it, um, how should I say, uh, because it's not color. But, you know, I provide this here in color and, I, and, I'll, and I'll make this available on the website and things of this nature. So the, the color scheme can help you to better uh, see exactly what I'm talking about here. So... You can see by the way that the, the 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 color is and how it's labeled that there's a continuation with with post classic Chiena into which is really proto Bantu um, and pre proto Bantu and so pre proto Bantu you, you see it's all the same color here so I'm showing that there's a direct uh, connection between the this branch here and what becomes proto Chibantu which becomes Gabaya and Chibantu here. But at the pre-Proto-Bantu stage, which is really just post-classic Chien and Intu, um, it splits into Parabantu Bere, and it's from Parabantu Bere that you get Middle Egyptian, Hasa, Zande, Mande, and the Sumerian language. But Gabaya and Chibantu remains on the same path. So, the, the reason why it's colored different here is because there's a there's some um, there's some linguistic things going on that changes how the language operates in 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 these branches over here while the the Chibantu remains um, true to the the proto language and how how the word formation and stresses and all that interacts. But from that um, post-classic Chiena into, you know, um, before it becomes pre-proto-Bantu, uh, a different branch holds off and becomes what we call the Behar branch. But the Behar branch splits itself into two branches. So um, that is represented here by Nuer and Wolof 
and then Coptic, Songo, Somali, Zerma, and Banda languages. And so, again, all of this is explained in the text. So when we talk about Bantu, is 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 really is kind of a bit more nuanced and complicated because what we're saying is that all of these are into languages, but what we're calling Bantu in the in the kind of modern sense is what I call Chibantu here, but all of these are into languages. So thus, Chinna into the into family belonging to into all of these are into. So even the word Ramech that you find in the Middle Egyptian to describe themselves is another variation of the word Bantu, which I've already done a uh, a presentation on on the uh, on YouTube, you know, some weeks back, and so you'll find it uh, the details of that in the introduction of you know my book, uh, Aluja Volume Two. So um, I hope that answers uh, your question, even though it may not answer your question. So let me see if there's, uh, what were the nations? I mean, um, I just want to say, I think that that, that that chart, chart, both of those charts is really, really, really good. Um, you know, to get people up to speed as you know as best as it can because you know it's it's very complex but that chart those two charts actually help a whole lot uh when, when people actually dive in and start reading and informing themselves about the information that that chart really really helps because you can get lost real quick <laughs> indeed yeah so that's why that's why i redid it and and color coded it so that, you know, hopefully, you know, uh, people can kind of follow along and see what is happening. So it's it, the best way that I can explain it is like, for example, say that me, um, Brother Ujawu and, and Brother Sanjeti are our blood brothers, right? We have the same mother and father. And then... Um, I, we all live in Atlanta, Georgia, right? But my two brothers, Brother Sanjeti and, and Brother Ujawu, they decide that they want to leave Atlanta, Georgia, but I'm the only one that stays. So Brother um, Sanjeti, he moves to D.C., Right? Brother Ujawu, he goes all the way to California. Now, we haven't been in touch, you know, much, but we've all gotten married. We all have kids. And, um, of course, our kids are going to have, you know, uh, a bit of our biogenetic makeup. Um, but, of course, they're going to have the biogenetic makeup of you know, the, the other half of the parents. But when we're talking about culture and things, now, because Wujawu and Brother Wuja, uh, and, and Brother Sanjeti, you know, come from Atlanta, they may bring some, um, some things to D.C. and Los Angeles, respectively. Uh, but in Los Angeles and in, Law, and, and in D.C., they have their own culture. And so when they bring the cultural elements that they originated in Atlanta, it's going to be modified when they hit L.A. and when they hit D.C. So it'll still be some recognizable elements, but because they're not home and surrounded by other ATLians for uh, all the uh, outcast fans, um, they're not surrounded by other AT aliens. They're not able to keep necessarily the, the traditions and the culture that makes ATL ATL and makes us who we are in family. But because I stayed in Atlanta and I had my children here in Atlanta and they had children here in Atlanta 
and all this, they were able, it's, it's easier for them to keep the traditions of whatever hypothetical it is that we're talking about because we stayed, you know, in the same um, home space and, you know, we kept the particular traditions. Whereas Brother Sanjeti and Brother Ujawu, they changed, you know, modified certain things. So if, if we can understand it in that kind of rudimentary analogy, you can see exactly on the chart exactly what we were talking about to where Chi and Intu forms, the Chi Bantu languages are able to keep those those particular characteristics of of Proto Bantu and um, Chi and Intu at large, whereas the branch that gave birth to Sumerian and Mande and Middle Egyptian, and the branch that gave birth to Coptic and Somali and Wolof they were modified in a way that is 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 still detectable in terms of the relationship but it is not the it's not the exact same as what you find in the in the um the the pre proto bantu berry branch and so that's why it's color coded the way that you saw it so that you can see what was continuous from the the uh in you know more faithfully to the mother tongue and what what branches modified themselves drastically in you know from the mother tongue but still keeps those those certain characteristics to where you can I'd still identify it as a china china into or a negro egyptian language so i hope that makes sense hold on one sec got our brother god killer in the house um just adding them to the panel what's up good brother Hold on, we can't hear you. Your mic is muted. Oh, yeah, this is oh, yeah, 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 yeah. They're crazy, man. Yeah, they need some class, man. Arguing with the young boys, man. You bugged out. Yeah, they, they trying to have the Diops, they'll file banger conversation. I'm like, y'all, it's whack. What's the nature of the conversation? What are they arguing? Oh, they arguing. You ain't got to go to South Netta, nigga. We right here. You just stupid, bro. You just dumb. I don't want to talk no more. You're dumb. Dumb. Yeah, he dumb. He think he can get... He, I swear, he swear they can get with you, shorty. I'm just telling you. It's just ridiculous. They can't get with you on that. It's a waste of time. So I just did the arguing for you. It's just a waste of time, yo. Crazy. Can't get past Wikipedia, yo. That's that's it. <laughs> crazy, crazy. Well, what's the what's the essential argument? That that Tail Five Bang ain't knew what he was talking about. That he couldn't change the language because whatever they read, it don't say it. No matter where they read it at, it don't say that. And they can't prove it. They can't prove it. They just gonna read with the It's too old. Yeah, that's that's a that's a that's a pseudo argument in and of itself. You have to be able. You you have to be able to demonstrate that he is false. And so, because anybody who's making that argument. That's why um, I know you weren't here um, for the beginning of the conversation, right, but I was right. going through the table of contents for the Illusion Volume 2 book. Okay. And okay. chapter nine is the chapter where um, I, I put together my theoretical framework and give a little history on historical comparative linguistics. And so in that, you probably have to turn that or mute your mic. Yeah, there you go. Um, in in that chapter, I I make the citations for why, for example, Afroasiatic is not considered uh, uh, an actual language family, and and the, and the issues with Greenberg. So, for example, matter of fact, I'll share my screen, and I'll and I'll give one example. So we're going to go to the text. We're going to go to chapter nine. See, because one of the things they can't do is try to make the argument that we're just making stuff up. Because what they try to say is that we're some crazy Afrocentrist who who are just making up arguments. And people got to know that the the idea, for example, that Afroasiatic is not a genetic language family 
is being echoed by other quote unquote white linguists. And so now they're going to have to classify all the white linguists who make the same argument as crazy Afrocentrists. So hold on one sec. I'm, I got to find the, the, the page in the chapter. What chapter am I on right here? This is chapter nine. So here we go. So let me just find a random example. Uh, Do 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 do. Um, do, 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 do. We're going to continue. Excuse me, as I. Uh, okay, that's a different argument. It's a very thorough book. So I even have, so yeah, so this it's under the section of the validity of the Greenberg model. And so um, I have a, a, a number of citations. So like, for example, when we're talking about the methodology of Greenberg and that created the, uh, the language phylums in the first place in Africa, we have to understand how linguists view his methodology. So for example, uh, Dr. R. M. W. Dixon, who is a linguist uh, who deals primarily with Australian languages. He wrote a text, The Rise and Fall of Languages in 1997. So on page 35, as it concerns Greenberg's methodology, he says, for many linguists, such views uh, pertaining to Greenberg's methods and his Eurasiatic superphylum fall more into the category of religious beliefs than scientifically testable hypotheses about on par with the claims that all languages have the same underlying deep structure and the position of the stars at the moment of our birth determines our character. What he's saying here is that Greenberg's method is as reliable as astrology. It's considered pseudoscience. So if we were to use the same methodology as those people trying to attack and, and claim that um, uh, Obinga's Negro Egyptian is pseudoscience, well, one, we know that they, they haven't looked at the language family. They haven't read his books. They're just making arguments uh, that are that are non-textual arguments. But we can say the same thing. We have texts where where other linguists are calling Greenberg's methodology uh, on par with um, astrology. So uh, let me skip to another one. Hold on. Really needs to come in. Uh, no, we're I'm still dealing with this methodology. I'm, I want to get specifically to Afro-Asiatic. Um, uh, let me see. Hold on. Hold on. Nope, nope, nope. Keep going. Yeah. Nope, nope, nope. Uh, let me see. Nope, we're still on Greenberg's methodology. See, like all these that are stuff that I'm quoting that I'm passing is citations um, criticizing Greenberg's methodology. All white boys. So, uh, uh, mm-mm-mm. Uh, I think I skipped it. Hold on. I think I passed it. Yep, I did pass it. Uh, 
I'm sorry. I got a, it's so much. And I don't have my physical book with me. I just ordered me my own book and it actually comes up here tomorrow. So I'm passing like the citations dealing with Niger Congo. I deal, deal with citations dealing with um, Nilo Saharan as well as Khoisan. So I end with Khoisan. Uh, no, that was my. Um, doo -doo 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 -doo. Nope. Nope, 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 nope. Um, I wish I had my physical book. It'd be easier for me to find. It's, it's one specifically that I'm looking for. There's others that I've that I've seen, but it's one specifically that I'm looking for. Um, no, no. Uh, nope. Oh, I'm breaking down how to do the historical comparative method. Uh, nope, I read that already. Y'all have to forgive me. Um, it, it's a specific citation that I'm looking for. And it's in here somewhere, and, I've, and I know I've skipped over. So I hope I, I didn't put it in the paragraph. Did I skip to Bantu? And so, oh, and for that that question dealing with Bantu and what is a Bantu language and things of that nature, I put it's in chapter nine that I deal with that uh, everything that I was just talking about now as well. Um, do, 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 do. Nope, nope, that's something different. Um, and it's a small citation. Or is it even in chapter nine? It should be in chapter nine. Uh, no, 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 That's not it. Yeah, here it is, I think. Yeah, Antonio Lopriano. So for those who remember uh, Antonio Lopriano, he is the one who wrote uh, the book uh, on uh, ancient Egyptian linguistics uh, uh, that came out in 1995, I think. Uh, peace to uh, Brother Zane Montego, and thank you. Uh, very much for your donation. Um, it is very well appreciated. Thank you. Uh, okay. So in, in this text here, um, Antonio Lopriano, uh, Lopriano uh, in his Das Verbal System Egyptian Zerkrundelgrundelgrundelgrundelgrundelgrundelgrundelgrundelgrundelgrundelgrundelgrundelgrundelgrundelgrundelgrundelgrundelgrundelgrundelgrundelgrundelgrundelgrundelgrundelg
but will rather represent Afroasiatic as a realized construct. Thus, Afroasiatic will never be a reconstructable language, but only the reconstructed sum of historically attested points of linguistic juncture, independent of their origin and carried out for the sake of particular investigation. Um, where does that? Oh, this sum may be interpreted in terms of genetic relationship, Sprachbrunn, aerial linguistics, or allogenetic relationship. The results of allogenetic contacts between the Afroasiatic languages will also have to be considered as belonging to the structure of quote unquote Afroasiatic. Just as much as much as are the results of genetic relationship, Afroasiatic can only be considered an abstract construct of linguistic features and not a unified system of linguistic realities. He's telling you here that as a genetic um, related family construct, it doesn't exist. You will never be able to reconstruct an Afroasiatic because what they're considering Afroasiatic are only typological features. And as I cite, um, 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 let me see if I cite this in here. It is a view and proposed in the view of the methods used to arrive within just as the methods have not written the evolution of aspects and is all supporting its matter of the development of the Okay, so this is Roger Blinch. You know, um, and he believes in Afroasiatic and Niger Congo and all this stuff. But he's he's saying something here that's very important. I should have bolded this. Um, in his article, New Developments in the Classification of Bantu Languages and Their Historical Implications, he says, in view of the importance of these proposed changes, it is, it is appropriate to review the methods used to arrive at them. Just as the substantive groupings or na uh, noun groupings of languages have changed, methods have not remained static. The evolution of classification techniques is almost as important as the expansion of actual data. Broadly speaking, developments during this century can be characterized as a gradual realization that typological criteria, no matter how persuasive the similarities, are not relevant to the genetic classification. So he's telling you here, and I cite some other citations echoing the same thing. Typological um, characteristics cannot classify languages. So when we go back up here to uh, Lupriano and when he says that uh, our comparisons will therefore have to renounce the traditional historical model of diachronic linguistics, meaning that we have to abandon the argument that Afroasiatic is a genetic classification and instead will extend a typological approach. So he's saying here that we can't argue that Afroasiatic, they're a genetic family tree, that they only um, are grouped together based on typology. They're not related languages um, in, the, in the sense, you know, that you could only detect by using the uh, historical comparative method. And so you'll see these citations all throughout this chapter. Which, which makes these arguments. So it, it challenges the methods of Greenberg. And again, these are all, I made sure that I only cited in, in this section, European scholars, so that no one can make the argument that... Um, yeah, what page, bro? Hold on, what page you been on, yeah? Uh, well, the one that I just cited about... Is that your, that's your book right there? Yeah. Yeah, what we'll page is that, bro? Uh, dang it. These really young boys out the way with Chris. Get your ass in here. Do my life. So this is starting on page 371. All right. Gotcha. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, so that's why you need your life course. All right, gotcha. So, you know, so they can't make it. Because when, because you know us, we don't like stuff when Africans and black folks say things. Yeah. You said so, 370, right? Right. 371 is when that started. I mean, again, the whole chapter, you have to read the whole chapter in context to really get it. But for that citation, it starts on page 371. 
Hey, hey if I may, may, go ahead. I want to reintroduce a word to the conscious community. It is incorrigible. Incorrigible. All right. I want everybody to look that word up. Incorrigible. All right. Uh, that's going to be the new word. That's going to that's going to be the um, safe word. You know, when you when you when you when you undergoing some pain of of uh, <laughs> these arguments that you see or read or hear, that's your safe word. Just holler out incorrigible. All right. So just want everybody to look that up. <laughs> Oh, God. Uh, I see uh, Brother Sanjetti had to leave. Probably got work in the morning or something like that. But uh, so you start at 371, right? It start where? On 371. Yeah, yeah. So that citation, you, you'll see the, the paragraph. The, the author is Antonio Lupriano. And then it's going to have a German title as of, of the text. So it should be like towards the, the the bottom of that page. It's saying view the present state of research and practice. Yes, of American American language. Language. correct. Well, beyond what we're trying to do, attain. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Even if, uh, what's this? Uh, and remember, remember Camino Semitic is is the name of Afroasiatic. Um, before, you know, a lot of folks, you know, use that name. So Hamido Semitic is Afroasiatic. It's the same, it's the same language. Right? Yeah, I got it. So, yeah. So once you start making citations like this, see, they don't understand the nature of the arguments. And so this is why they can never go about proving that, you know, Afroasiatic is a valid language construct because they don't know how to do it. So you have these professionals who who actually believe in Afroasiatic because when you read Antonio Lupriano's work and Roger Blink's work, they're operating within Niger Congo Afroasiatic respectively. But when you when you comes down to can you establish and 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 validate these language constructs? They, they can't do it. And they admit that. That's the point. And they're telling you that, you know, that Afroasiatic is based on typology. And in linguistics, typological uh, characteristics are not suitable for language categorization. So a, a typology, remember, they're borrowing terms from biology. So, you know, you know, uh, Brother Unk, you're familiar with for example, like this concept of convergence. So say that a group of individuals, you know, saying migrate all around the equator. Because they live on the equator, they're going to have darker skin, typically, if, if they, you know, exist and live there for a long time. They're going to they're going to have they tend to have darker skin. So but just because, for example, that um, somebody lives on you know, close to the equator and they have dark skin and and let's say, quote unquote, uh, stereotype stereotypical Negro hair that that makes them Africans. So when you see these people doing a lot of liquorship saying, you know, well, there's some black, there may be black people. Yes, but you couldn't call them Africans. They've been out of Africa for 30,000 years. So they're not speaking any African languages. They've developed genetically their own haplogroups outside of Africa. We're all Africans in the human sense, but in the way that we modernize and characterize these 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 groups, they're not Africans per se. They're blacks, but they're not Africans in the strictest sense. So if if you consider, for example, the 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 Jarawa people in in India Africans. You would have to consider white people Africans. Because white people come out of India as well, ultimately, and they've been out of Africa just as long as uh, the Jarawa people been out of Africa. So they can't be not Africans, um, the Jarawa people, and, and at the same timeline being out of Africa, white people are not. So we have to be careful 
in how we do this. So we don't do liquor strips. So that topology, they may develop darker skin, curlier hair, wider noses, et cetera, et cetera. This doesn't make them, quote unquote, Africans. And so I um, want to give a, a, a shout out to, hold on, to Academics82. Thank you for the uh, donation as well. Um, it's very much appreciated. <laughs> and so, again, these, these donations will help with buying journal articles and stuff to that nature. And all I'm going to do is give it out and share with the people, um, you know, saying for free. So I appreciate everything that y'all uh, are doing. And so <laughs> he said, uh, who is this? Um... Somebody just asked the question. So 42 tribes, it says white people come out of India, huh? Yes, white people come out of India. And so um, let me, I got to share my screen again. So, and, and when you, when you, Let me make sure, okay, making sure the screen is saying. So as I discuss, I discussed this in Where is the Love that came out in 2015. And I revamped this argument or this, this data uh, soon. And remember I said, ultimately, white people come out of India. Um, I'm dealing with the issue of Semitic. This is coming from chapter 13, the last chapter of Eluja volume two. Oh, no, that's the bibliography. Let me go back up and skip something. Let me go slower because I think the image will take a second to pop up because it's so detailed. Um, here we go. So um this comes from the genographic project of the national geographic and so i get the citation in the text so they're they're arguing for the out of africa um route so they're saying into india and peopling of eurasia based on recombinational analysis so what they're saying is that you know for the most part central africa is the home uh central east africa is the home of humanity in 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 more up-to-date you know genetic analysis you start to see some some people arguing for southern africa um being the origin but either way it goes southern africa they traveled here into central africa so this is you know the main hub you know for coming out of africa and so there's some other studies that also argue that some came out of um, the Nile Valley through Egypt, but we'll get into that, you know, at another time. But as you can see, the, the they're arguing for a southern route out of kind of Ethiopia into Yemen and southern Arabia and through, through southern Arabia into India. So we got to pay attention to the directions of the arrows here. So you see these arrows going into southern um India, and then from here you have this one branch that goes ultimately here into these islands, and then of course these folks ultimately end up here in Australia, and so, but then you have this branch that goes into China, into Japan, and then these are the folks going, becoming the Alt Altians and, you know, Uyghur, whatever, however you pronounce this area into China. But notice this branch over here. So there's, there's talking about two, after they even came into India, there's two branches that split off. So one going in here becoming the Chinese and ultimately the, um, the, the indigenous folks of Russia and stuff to this nature. Then you have this other branch that branches off and then itself splits into two branches. So one branch comes all the way over here and becomes ultimately the Europeans. 
then you have another branch that comes and becomes uh becomes the people over here in iran and ultimately you know mesopotamia and then you know you have these folks here so these are the native folks that were already in the area when negro egyptian speakers migrated out of egypt and settled into the levant it is the mixing of these negro egyptian speakers who came out way after these are not the negro egyptian speakers are not out of africa africans this comes way later you know anywhere between you know 7000 you know bce to you know 3500 bce you know it's these different waves of africans who come in here and interact with these the native folks here and this is what gives you uh, proto-semitic and then you have another wave here that comes and ultimately becomes proto-indo-european as far as the language is concerned but ultimately these people who become white folks within the last 12,000 years had their origins in india so this is why you see like when you go into all these akastans and Chekistans and all of this other kind of stuff they look like white folks and these aren't you know white folks who came and you know back who back migrated into into these areas that's these are the beginnings of the physical characteristics that ultimately become these folks so that's that's what i'm talking about um uh 42 tribes so hopefully that makes sense um so let me see uh uh sar can you give me the name of the book you got what um what book are you talking about um let me see let me go back up give the name of the book again Asar. what what book are you talking about um what i put it like this what was i talking about when i mentioned the book because the book that i'm talking about is eluja volume two of course but um, did, did I mention another book? Um, uh, hold on one second. I'm, I'm just scrolling up, so I'm just trying to make sure that I didn't miss, uh, you know, any commentary. Um, and so, let me see, melanin is a social quote, there's any facts, trans peace, brother, right, so uh, white people come out of India, huh, okay, so not, so uh, this book needs to be in Africa, uh, right, there's not a lion and or a tiger in Europe, one is in Africa, the other is in Asia region, great show, thanks for the sign. Uh, is that where we got Indo-European? Yeah, Indo-European comes from the fact that it's just like Afro-Asiatic. So what they're saying is that languages that belong to this quote-unquote family exist on both the Asian continent and the African continent. So Afro-Asiatic. And so they're doing the same thing with Indo-European. So the Indo-European family, the languages, you can find them in India as well as um, in, in Europe. So it's just Indo-European, but they argue, they don't argue that Indo-European starts in, in, in India, that it starts, you know, Europe kind of in between that and Russia, you know, how Europe is, uh, is a, a weird construct in the first place It's really just West Asia. But, um, and then they spread downwards going back into India. So, um, let me see. The book you citing Greenberg. Um, was I citing Green or was I or was I talking about uh, Loprieto? Because I was talking about Greenberg. So that was my the book that I was sharing was my book. That's chapter nine of Eluja volume two, where I was talking about Greenberg. Or, or are you talking about, I think, yes. 
Huh? Oh, he's talking about the pseudoscience one. That's um, the rise and fall of languages by uh, R. M. W. Dixon. So I think that's the book that he's talking about. Hold on. R. M. W. Dixon. Uh, the rise and fall of languages. Uh, 1997. So I think that's the, so yeah, if that's, if that's what you're talking about, I just put that, the title in the, the chat. Um, okay. You're welcome. You're welcome. Um, someone asked the question, we know that dynastic Egyptian uh, Radio One asks the question, we know that dynastic Egyptian colonies settled in lands outside of Egypt, but why they built no Egyptian temples or pyramids in those foreign lands? Um, I don't think they felt it necessary. Um, you know, they, they, they brought some aspects of their cultures and even the, the, the temple designs for the indigenous religions. Now, remember that the Egyptians are not they're not religiously colonizing folks. It's business for them. So they're not trying to necessarily impose their culture on people. The, the, the people were able to keep their culture, but they had a lot of influence in even how they, these other people, um, you know, begin to adapt ancient Egyptian concepts in terms of worship and temple building. You see that, you know, in those areas, but not necessarily uh quote unquote egyptian temples in those areas it, it's not unnecessary because they're traveling back back home so they're not trying to give away necessarily they're kind of really stingy with their culture so the culture that you have in terms of the influence that's because of the other people going in visiting kemet and taking that back with them you know because even still even when the egyptians were ruling these other places you only had a few Egyptians in those areas. They were really being administered by native folks. So it's just like how when the European came into Africa, they have, you know, white folks there, but the people who were running the colonies were black folks. So they didn't necessarily need to put like a whole administration. They didn't need to put another, you know, big, large catholic church for example in the middle of the congo they didn't they didn't there was no re reason to do that because they're heading back and dealing with their own society back home uh megalithic structures are all over the east kemet lamont has 12 inside stone we lost grand lamont the architecture with an indirect influence that, that and that's what i i argue so you know um let me see. Um, I don't see any other. Um, um, as I said, the Reed Sea didn't always exist. Africa and so called Middle East were connected not so long ago. Um, let me repeat that aloud. Uh, Asiatic Black Man makes the comment London Geological Institute says. The Reed Sea, I assume this is the Red Sea, didn't always exist. Africa and so-called Mideast were connected not so long ago. We got to remember that all of these continental borders are not natural borders. They're political borders made by human beings. So just like with, with the comment that I made earlier, there's no such thing as a natural Europe. Europe is just West Asia. But they just decided they want to make it something distinction for themselves. So they made that arbitrary boundary, just like there's no real boundary between Africa and Asia. These are all political boundaries. And so we always got to keep that in mind. These are social constructs, even when you call someone an African, so to speak. And so that's that's, you know, we should not take necessarily the geological political borders as equivalent to that these groups of people are essentially the same. 
you know, there's 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 variation and there's continuity because there's been interaction. You know, ancient Egypt is a, a confluent zone. So you get people coming in from inner Africa and you got people coming in from um, Western Asia and Europe. It's just a central spot for which a lot of folks are traveling back and forth. And so, you know, they they don't have those. They didn't know they was in Africa. You know, the 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 Semites didn't know they were in Asia. The Greeks didn't know they were in Europe. You know, these are all modern political borders and classifications. And so also what is a West African? Again, this is these are all political constructs. These are all social constructs. And so, you know, you're saying a West African is someone who is native to the Western part of Africa. That's it. It's, that's, there's not a, nobody, there's no identity of West African. There's no West African language. There's no West African customs. It's just a geological classification. Those individuals who live on the West side, if you split um, Africa in half, it is a... Uh, um, it's just on the west side, on the left side of the map. That's it. Um, somebody asked the question, Radio 1 asked the question, were the founders of Napata and the ancestors of the 25th, 25th dynasty Egyptians or Kushites or both? Um, I'm going to argue that they were Kushites. But I could argue that they were Egyptians as well. But we got to understand that Egyptian by this time is not a genetic, it's not a biological family. It's just like saying an American. Like, like is Barack Obama, you know, uh, an African or an African American or, or is he American? You know, he's, he's, quote unquote half African at least, uh, at least on his father's side, but we all consider him black. You know, we know the one drop rule here in the United States. So he's a black American, but he's American by his um by his nationality. And so you have folks who are Egyptians who are who have other ethnicities. So, for example, let me share my screen again. And if Wujawa, you want to um, chime in afterwards um, and say something, uh, I'm going to open the floor to you. So, let me share my screen again. And this is something that I noted in my last conversation on West Africa. And, you know, we got to pay attention to something here. So let me, excuse me, as I scroll, I don't know what um, slide it is on, but this is from my conversation of last week concerning the relationship between West Africa and the now the ancient Nile Valley. And so there was a it should be hold on. Uh, area but would that be here we go so for example there's certain characteristics that you can see among the different tribes in identity markers that in the actual ancient Egyptian text so this is a picture of quote unquote native Egyptians doing kind of everyday cattle herding, right? But what this really is, is a picture of Afar men 
who lived in ancient Egypt. And, you know, they're very distinctive because of their, their white Afros. And this is what you see all throughout this, this, this particular relief here, these white Afros. And, you know, if, if you weren't cognizant of the different ethnic groups in the Sudan and in, in the Eastern region of the Sahara or whatnot, you would think that this is just some kind of artistic, um, some kind of artistic variation of the froze and stuff here, but that's not the case. This is a, a this is an accurate depiction of a distinctiveness of these Afar people who would put these kind of fats and oils in their hair and walk around with these with these white afros, which they still do today. And these are still cattle herding Afar people. But these are ancient Egyptians. But they're a different ethnic group from the quote-unquote remetch. So when you see this, these types of reliefs, you have to be able to distinguish the groups involved. So these are Egyptians, but they are a distinct group, just like the Mexicans and the Italians and the um, the Cherokee and the African Americans, et cetera, et cetera, all different ethnic groups who are all American and are citizens of the United States of America. So this is this is what you find in in the release so you'll find different groups different ethnic groups speaking totally different languages who exist and live in 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 ancient kemet who you will find in all types of wall reliefs so you know to answer that question again it's yes and no at the same time so um if you have anything to say brother Wujawa. No, I'm uh, <laughs> just start taking it in. You know, I saw I saw that presentation. That was, that was an excellent presentation um, on that. You know, and I commented about that to, to others as to the difference of that presentation that you did with West Africa. You know, the connections between West Af you know East and West Africa, and using the tool of linguistics and actually a you know the multifaceted to you know all the disciplines. To kind of answer that question as opposed to just scant evidence and some things that may or may not look look alike and things like that so but now i think you can add just uh, that was an excellent presentation i appreciate it i appreciate it i do want to say, wanna say oh, oh, go ahead i'm sorry yeah i do want to say when it comes to um that that kind of question and topic about east Africa and West Africa and migrations. You know, one thing I was stressing in that conversation that I was having with, with folks was that we have to definitely be mindful of what makes a people a people. Like what what is the criteria that is used to label a people this, you know, X, people X versus people Y. And, you know, I think people need to really, really pay attention to that because people may have may mischaracterized that in that discussion that's what i've seen and so with your presentation you know you provided the tools or you know the ingredients that will allow for that to be considered while other people i've seen argue and, and have that conversation they don't and the conversation ends up going you know around the world and and, and it's very a ambiguous so yeah just want to make sure people understand that what makes a people uh, a, a people you know, it can't be skin color. It's not over there in the continent of Africa. You know, it has to be some criterion set. So, yeah. Indeed, indeed. Well, um, we're now going on three hours and 48 minutes. And so I did not intend for it to go this long, but, you know, I'm up for it. Um, so I, I'm not trying to do a a what's his name brother garfield type show where we'll be on for eight hours um and and nobody will go through and re-listen to the show so i'm going to end the show right now i want to thank 
everyone who has listened live and been with us for these four hours. Um, I thank uh, everyone who has joined the panel, Brother Sanjeti, Brother Ankh, Brother Bujawu, and I thank all of you in the chat who have asked uh, great and wonderful questions. Um, again, um, this is a the first of probably five or six Q&A sessions for the book, Aluja Volume 2, Sheena Into Religion and Philosophy, that was just released in January of 2020. And um, so, you know, for those who have the book already, thank you for your support. And I look forward to your questions. So you can always hit me up um, on my website, asarmhotep.com, or on my Facebook or Twitter. Uh, it's kind of easy to find me. Just search Asarm Hotep, and I'm pretty sure that I will come up in any one of those uh, search engines for those uh, social media platforms. And so um, you can hit me up there. And thank you all to those who have donated um, tonight. Um, I appreciate y'all greatly. So um, for the sake of time, I'm going to uh, end the show. And if you have just any last words, uh, I'll let y'all uh, end it. So uh, go ahead, Brother Bujawa. Uh Nothing to add. I uh, appreciate the, the, the shows and um, keep, keep the shows coming. Um, I did have a question, actually. I remember, I remember some years back, you were working on some material, and I don't know if, if the titles of, of your books shifted or, you know, some material that was going to go into one book under a certain title was moved to the books that you end up publishing between uh, Loser Volume 1 and 2. But I remember it was one about uh, Kemet, uh the sun deity or ra and punt or something to that effect I'm, i know you you know what i'm talking about it, is that still something that um, you're doing or, or was that kind that of kind swallowed, swallowed up, up into, 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 into what, what we, got? we got yeah yeah that kind of got swallowed up so some of that is in illusion volume two and um other aspects of it will be published in future publications and so um a matter of fact, we'll we'll probably be dealing with that in our own publication um, on the expanded version of the debate on the meaning of the place name Kemet. So that that was in that was a you know kind of an anticipation of dealing with I was going to deal with the word Kemet in its own text, and um, so that's what that was. But that that has been abandoned, um, and so because I've I've done done the article in the Luja Volume Two. And then we're going to do our expanded conversation. So there's just no need for me to deal with that uh, as a separate, you know, saying entity, you know, already. So, yeah, that kind of got swallowed up. And matter of fact, that was an illusion book. So. But um, if that's it, uh, I don't even know if Brother Unk is still listening. He's probably still uh, arguing. Uh, <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, so I, I, I may log off here and then go try to check out. I assume it's on his channel, on the on what's the name channel. So I'll probably go over there and just kind of listen in and see what they're talking about. I right, appreciate, right, appreciate it. All right, no doubt, no doubt. So again, I appreciate everyone. Um, I need to stop saying um so much, but thank you all for listening. I appreciate you all, and y'all have a, a, a blessed night until the next uh, conversation. So peace.